All right, we are here. We are live. Well, not live. It's uh, February 23rd, uh, 2019. Uh, my name is uh, well, my name is Walter. I go by Ursat's Cats Online, and I've got uh, Robert Murchek, one-time head referee of Twin Galaxies, here on the line. How are you doing today, Robert? Good afternoon, Walter. How are you? Ah, fantastic. Let's see. Let's bring everything up. So, uh, just to give uh, anybody watching this a little background, uh, I personally have been uh, researching this Billy Mitchell dispute case even long after the actual dispute has ended, and I came across a series of old videos on the MTV website wherein uh, Robert Merchek shows off Billy Mitchell's brand new uh, Donkey Kong record in 2006. Now, the interesting part about this is that it was in, in 2006, and these videos have sat untouched all these years. Uh, Billy Mitchell's people have tried to blame Dwayne Richard and say, like, oh, somebody came along and stole all, like, snuck into people's homes and stole all the tapes and switched them out with uh, name replicas or something to that effect. And this basically shoots all of that down, because uh, we could see in the videos that Billy Mitchell's tapes were main tapes even within a month of them being adjudicated. This was in uh, February, and uh, his score is verified January 31st. So that's sort of the backdrop for this interview, and it's going to be the main focus. But we got some other questions as well. So let's go ahead and start with that, Robert. Um, let's start from. All right. Oh, yeah. And one thing is, um, uh, when I do interview, like you've done many interviews. They're great interviews. Uh, you've covered a lot of the background stuff on like uh, the events of the movie King of Kong over the years very extensively. Um, and you, you can, of course, go over that again if you want. I'm not going to stop you, anything you want to talk about. But my interest in it is more like, you know, the, stu the stuff that hasn't been asked, stuff that hasn't been talked about. So I'm going to assume the listener has heard a lot of the story leading up to the showing at Fun Spot in 2005 that everybody saw in the movie King of Kong. And uh, we're going to start from there. How about, uh, so they're showing the movie. It's on this VCR. It's on this TV that. Uh, well, that, that's actually the tail end of it. There's a whole bunch of it that um, came before that. Absolutely. I'm sure if you're interested in hearing that. But the whole side story as far as how the TV got the fun spot, let alone when and how it was shown. Absolutely. Let's do it. It's presented a fun spot. I can go over the details if you want. Absolutely. Or, Picked up from the minute it was uh, shot at by Fun Spot. Absolutely. Um, my my particular interest in is what happened to the tape after Fun Spot, from that to when you were showing it on MTV. But well, we, uh, anything you want to talk about, uh, we can go over the uh, background one more time if you want. For starters, uh, the tape that Billy was supposed to send was a surprise. He told us that something is going to arrive and it was to be presented at Fun Spot. He wouldn't say what. It was kind of orchestrated, of course. He sent the wrong tape initially because we were watching it in my cabin before the Fun Spot event. It's a wrestling tape. So he makes a big point to send the next tape out via Overnight Express Airfare as Brian King picks the tape up at the airport and physically bring it over to Fun Spot. And we start to watch it in the cabin with the explicit instructions that we're supposed to watch one third of the tape on the first day, one third on the second day, the second day being Friday, one third of the tape on Saturday at Fun Spot. And then um, at that point, um, Ryan at Fun Spot brings the tape over. Uh, watch the first uh, day of it on Thursday in the cram cabin. And uh, there's about 30 people watching that. And the second portion of it, since the crams did not allow us to watch the second portion of their cabin, we watched it fine. And it was about a dozen people there watching it. Some left by the end of the second third and kept watching it through the end. So when it was shown on Saturday night at Fun Spot, we already knew what was coming. And on Saturday, uh, Brian Koo, at uh, Billy's direction, he was trying to set the TV up on top of the Donkey Kong machine <laughs> at Fun Spot, even though we had no permission from Fun Spot management to do so. And Fun Spot Management found out about that, that being Gary Vincent. That was shot down. By the end of the day, they ended up setting the uh, TV up in the back of Fun Spot on the same floor with the Donkey Kong machine, about, let's say, 15 to 20 feet from where the machine was. And Steve Levy shows up. Um, he was there from the um, previous night, actually. 
And on the second night, we were watching in my cabin, Brian Poole announced that Steve Levy was not allowed to watch that tape, which was funny because Billy said he had no idea Steve was showing up. So basically, <laughs> I think the whole thing about Billy not knowing Steve was there was a crock. Um, so Saturday comes, and Steve Weaver, that's fun, he's doing his thing, and that's the day, by the way, he actually got the first kill screen at Fun Spot. And meanwhile, just 15 feet away from him, the tape was playing on the uh, TV set, and everyone's watching that too. And that's where Billy's Billion and 47 was seen by everyone for the first time. And that tape, by the way, was a uh, orchestrated performance because Billy intentionally, not only, got exactly 100,000 more than Steve. 2001 performance or 2002, I forget the year, but he also orchestrated it so that he rolled over the score with all zeros in uh, one of the elevator stages and then he slow played the next several boards to get to a million forty seven two hundred. Um, when that tape was shown at Front Spot, it was not supposed to be a TG submission, but in the background, uh, off to the side, the videographers from KOK actually filmed Walter on the phone with Billy, and supposedly Billy was telling him, yeah, go ahead and put it in, even though we had agreed the night before in my cabin that we couldn't, because there was a big glitch in the tape, and it was clear that it wasn't Billy's master tape, so we couldn't accept the score. But Walter does it anyway, the day that the uh, tape is shown in front of everyone, and KOK actually shows him entering the score for the scoreboard, the following day, after I'm back home on my job, I'm looking at the TG scoreboard at lunch hour, and I see that the score is up there. So I call up our CTO, Brian King, one of the other board of directors at uh, the Galaxy, and we immediately agreed to take it down, since we had both agreed just two days before the cabin that score could not be accepted. Well, three days before, it was a Friday we agreed. And so we took the score down, and then Billy wanted to score um, recognized, so he eventually sent me the master tape several months later, and I watched it, and it looked good, because at the time, the stuff that was uh, uncovered during the dispute by Jeremy Young about the finger on the girder, etc., we didn't know that stuff mm -hmm. 15 years prior, or how many years prior it was, it 2005, 13 years prior, 14 years prior, so that stuff we simply was not aware of. So um, well, we made a good faith effort to say, look at the tape, and, you know, it looks good. But it clearly wasn't, and it clearly was Billy playing the game, made to look like he was playing VHS. And so that score that was touted as being the new world's record way back in 2005, turns out it was not uh, a fraud. Mm -hmm. So um, my understanding is that, you know, like you, as you said, the um, tape that was shown at Fun Spot in 2005 was, like, not complete, basically? Yeah, it, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a complete tape. It was <clears throat> not the master tape. Mm. They apparently sent us a copy of the master. And as a result of that, the scene where it glitches out as it rolls past a million was really, really bad. Plus, if our memory serves, there was another which moment somewhere in the six to seven hundred thousand range mm. that was very difficult to adjudicate. So we decided that overall that tape could not possibly pass muster. So Billy, uh, after the front spot event, he said he would send in the master tape. Now the tape that was originally sent to the front spot event, Dwayne Richard never ever touched the tape. Mm. The first attempt that Billy made to send the tape was sent to Greg Irway. That was the wrestling tape that he mm -hmm. says by accident <laughs> was, so he says by accident. Which never made it into the movie. In custody of Ryan Koo all throughout the event. The master tape was sent directly to me from Billy. Oh. Yeah, Billy sent me the tape direct. Direct, that's... that's yes, direct. That, that is Mitchell interesting. In Florida. It didn't come from Walt, it didn't come from anyone else, it came from Billy to me. Mm. And that... made custody of the tape to verify it. Was that? Uh, what was that last part again? I had custody of the tape at that point. Wayne Rich never had custody of the tape up to that point in time that Billy score was in the process of being adjudicated by me after the event. Once Billy score was entered into the, 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 the database, at some point, for his own edification and to check out whether or not these things were legit, Wayne borrowed a couple of tapes, including some of Steve Weeks. Mm. Not before the score.
reports were already verified. Mm -hmm. Is that what, um, because Billy has referred to Dwayne uh, taking tapes, quote, out of the library. Is that it, or is that a different thing? Well, if Billy has a library, then that's news to everyone, because he's never mentioned he has a library. <laughs> library, there is no such thing. Yeah. It was a, uh, basically the size of a refrigerator with several boxes of about 15 or 1600 videotapes I had in my home. So that's not the TG library. That's Robert's collection of TG tapes that I was basically housing as a TG employee or rather a TG volunteer. All right. So thank you. I just, I just want to make crystal, absolutely crystal clear on this point. So Billy sent you the tape, and that is the exact tape you both used to adjudicate the score and the one that you showed Stephen Totillo in the interview to display the score. Yeah, that. Because the tape that Billy had at the 8 Candle event, that tape, I never saw that tape after that. That tape was with Brian Coon. Mm. What he did with it at that point, I only know. Yeah. But the master tape, that arrived to me directly from Billy post-event. And that was the tape that went to Stephen Pillow. I never saw the original ACAM tape with the uh, severe glitch in it, the copy of the master tape after that. Wow, that's interesting. So that that is <laughs> that's very interesting. Uh, I wanna... you now you know the chain of custody of everything. Yeah. Uh, I do want to ask you about something you just mentioned. Uh, so uh, there's been debate as to whether the million point rollover. So like if you watch the movie, it's got that, that static right where the thing is. And then a later copy surfaces and there's been arguments. Oh, they just edited that in. So you were saying earlier that, that really was a thing when you all watched the original time, the, uh, the static at the million. When, when we watched it at phone spot for the very first time, it looked pretty bad. As far as uh, difficult to see, it was um, obviously a glitch in the recording of it. But all of a sudden, a section of the tape, specifically the top section where the score is, it just glitched out. It was um, difficult to see the graphics correctly. And quite honestly, it wouldn't have passed adjudication muster. The subsequent master tape wasn't crystal clear perfect, but it was a lot better than the one from Fun Spot. Mm. All right. The totality of the performance, as far as Mario continuing to move in the right direction and all the barrels, or whatever scene had happened, I believe it was a barrel scene. Um, no, 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 it was an elevator scene. It was an elevator scene. And everything seemed to be going exactly with the same trajectory and movement path that it had before at that point, so it looked good. Uh, I hate to correct you, but uh, the million point rollover actually was on a barrel screen. It was. Uh... Are you sure? I thought the million 47, what he did, was he was in the elevator port. You, no, hold on. Maybe it was the barrel screen. I remember he was standing by a ladder, and he went up just at the 998-500 mark, and he had 1,500 bonus, and it went to all zeros. That's my recollection. Yeah, that's from the barrel board, then, my mistake. But yeah, that, 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 that's basically what happened, but it was because uh, you can't really do that on the elevator stage anyway because of the way the elevators are. Oh, that's right, yeah. So he had 998-500, if I remember right. He went up to 1,500 left from the bonus yep. down here and went to all zeros. Yep, that's exactly, yep. Um, I'm sorry about that, but, you know, it is yeah. 14 years ago now. It's Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, and that kind of thing is uh, directly on the video, so it's not, not a problem on that. I do, well, honestly, that answers so many of the, the major questions I had, but I definitely have some more. Um... If, uh, uh, oh, here's one. Um, so, uh, you have talked about, um, Steve Weeby's submission, the one that's at the end of the movie, and how it was unacceptable with the breaks in continuity. Yeah, um, that, that particular tape, and I, I said this multiple times, the performance itself looked solid, but Steve broke continuity of performance at the beginning. What he did is he started his film extensively showing how he's inserting the board, hooking everything up. And that was fine. And then the next thing you see on his tape, he, the camera's already focused on the front of the machine. And he's um, ready to go. It's already booted up. So you don't really know from the stuff where he's inserting the board. You don't know what happened from there to point B where the machine's already turned on. 
for all you know, he had paused and he did something in the back and, you know, he had to start again and we do the way flying your race heads worked on VCRs. It's like the seamless jump from the beginning what he did to where he was. So breaking continuity of performance. And then at the end of the performance, uh, we played the whole game out, he finished it, and then he positions the camera so that it's focusing on the top left quadrant where the score is. And then he goes behind the machine and does something for about 20, 25 seconds or so. And then he takes the camera off the tripod, takes it in his hand and walks to the back of the machine and goes, here's the boards. So basically, you don't know what he did in that 20 or 25 seconds. Um, you don't know what he did at the beginning when he went from inserting the board set to the machine already being on. So while the performance itself was perfectly fine to me, it was the break in the continuity of the taping that I couldn't get past as a referee. And I told mm. Walter, I can't verify this one. So what happened after that, you can have the Walter pressure me to adjudicate it based on the totality of the performance, and I wouldn't. Then makes three copies of the performance, and he sends it out to three TG referees. He sends it out to Greg Irway, Sean Clam, Todd Rogers. And as I've said multiple times in the past, one of these guys watched the whole performance, one of them watched half the performance, and one of them didn't watch it at all. But even so, Walter, based on what limited feedback he did get from them, Walter decides to adjudicate, to have approved the tape for acceptance anyway. So basically, he just simply wanted the tape accepted, mm. I hope or by hook. And that was one of the three reasons I resigned from TG. I couldn't, I just couldn't stomach that at that point. Why did, uh, since we're on the topic anyway, uh, why, what were the other two reasons you resigned? Well, one of the other two reasons had to do with uh, Roy Schill. Roy Schill mm. is uh, one of the, uh, major colorful characters in TV <laughs> history. And one of the things that one of referees did, came to a conclusion on, because Roy's marathon score, he, um, for years, was refusing to give his details about the marathon score, even down to the simplest questions, such as how long did it take, how many rollovers did he have, sorry, now how many um, uh, times did he um, roll the screen count over at 256, what happened at 255, 256, you didn't know any of this stuff. And missile command is a very specific game in terms of how you handle rollovers due to uh, a number of issues with the city counters rolling and running over 256. So between that and then later, Roy admitting on an interview that he had um, played at, uh, what's that called? He called it Atari settings. Um, we, we decided that uh, even before he said that, that Roy's story just no longer could possibly uh, hold true. There was so many holes in his tournament setting score story that we just had it. And we, under Walter's original TT Book of Rules, which said that if one score is false, they're all deep false mm. removed from the database. I removed them from the database. Mm. And Walter demanded that I put him back. And basically, I told him, no. <coughs> Walter basically said, you have to put him back. And that's second reason I left TG, and the third one is, has to do with splitting the Atari 2600 platform into uh, what was basically one collective pool, one score per title and track. He wanted it broken down into NTSC, PAL, and emulation. Mm. I didn't want to do that for a year. He finally convinced me to do it, and I did it, and uh, people didn't like the way it was done, one person in particular. Walter gave me zero support on the forums, and basically the forum uh, exchanges became extremely volatile. So because of complete lack of support from Walter and the transition, which he did nothing to teach his bottom line, uh, between that and the Steve Reeve issue with the 1049 adjudication and the Roy Schilt issue, um, I just got fed up and quit. Mm. So, um, let's see, what were, when you adjudicated Billy's 1.047 million score, uh, what were the alleged circumstances behind it? Obviously, he said it was a direct feed. Did he say, like, where it was played or any other circumstances behind the actual achievement Billy, of it? Billy was very cryptic 
um, as far as his earlier performances. The only thing I know for a fact is that his million fourteen performance, which he revealed in um, August of two, July to mm. August of 2004, he claims that he did that performance a year earlier in 2003. Uh, that was basically his way of trumping Steve Wheat. Mm. First million and six four was the first TG recognized million and six four. Uh, at that point in time, even though TG did not formally end up recognizing it, we just simply recognized having a face. Um, and Billy's million forty seven, he made a big production out of getting this special tape for the Fun Spot two thousand five event. And when he did it, was never made apparent to anyone. He never told me. Uh, directly, whether he told Walter, I'll never know, or Brian Coo or anyone else. He never said when he did the tape. He just simply made sure that we got it for the event. But obviously, he did it after Steve Leeb's 947 200, since it was yeah. intentional, and he beat it by 100,000. We'll just never know for sure exactly when he did it. Mm -hmm. And he just told you at the time, this is just direct feed? Billy never said anything. He just sent us a tape in and said the mm. tape was going to arrive um, and gave Brian Cool instructions on how to show the tape. We didn't even know it was going to be a Donkey Kong tape before it arrived. We had no idea. Mm, oh, interesting. So uh, the next, this next question, uh, I'm going to have to bust your balls a little bit on this one. Uh, Maybe a tough question. Yeah, <laughs> but um, if... The the continuity breaks on Steve Weeby's submission were unacceptable and made in your eyes that you couldn't verify. Why is it that Billy's direct feed with no video whatsoever of the kind of background and board stuff or anything, why was that accepted? Well, to be perfectly honest with you at that point in time, Chi Chi did not have a policy of not accepting direct feeds. That mm. wasn't instituted until a little while later. Um, Billy had done direct feeds in the past, which were accepted by Walter Day, dating back to even before I was a teaching referee. It was mm. Billy's first uh, performance that I'm aware of that was direct feed was um, his centipede performance. And I actually saw that oh. one in Mall of America 2001. Oh. Um, his um, Pac-Man 1999 performance, that was not a direct feed. That was an over-camera view. But earlier performances by Billy... Uh, that were direct feed were accepted by Walter. Uh, Billy was a TG board member, so that kind of, in all honesty, gave him a little bit of extra credibility that it should, that everything should have been treated impartially. Mm -hmm. And again, you could look back 15, 20 years later and say, well, what was done wrong? This is one of the things that was done wrong. A Twin Galaxies board member was given a little bit of extra credibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a performance that should not have been accepted in that format. It's, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. That was number one. As far as yeah. the glitch goes, uh, we watched the performance with enough TG uh, people on hand, Brian King, Greg Irway, Walter, and myself, to recognize that while it wasn't the mess that we were watching, um, it was a continuous performance. And that, that's undeniable. It wasn't like it was... Um, uh, what, what do you call a safe state performance? Mm. It, it was a clear, it was a clear continuous performance. But again, it's direct feed. Quite honestly, we shouldn't have accepted it back. It was a mistake. Mm. Yeah. And like I said before, you know, when we were grassroots, we were trying our best, and certain mistakes that are made, um, they overshadow all the other stuff that you might have done. That's not a mistake, and it, it is what it is at this point. There's no changing history there's no denying that it was done it shouldn't have been done it doesn't change the fact that it was done but the reality is is that um it should not have been done absolutely that's a good answer um uh i would like to know more about this uh 2001 centipede submission by billy i'm actually not aware of this well it wasn't a submission he did in 2001 that was a more of america with walter and billy and Dwayne. Walter was showing two videos to the masses in the rotunda section of the Mall of America event, one of which was the um, Pac-Man kill screen, because most people never saw a kill screen on Pac-Man before. 
he too wasn't around, so it's not like we could just go on the internet and see, you know, Chima show me Pac-Man kill skin. So Walter mm-hmm. showed that. And uh, he also showed some of Billy's centipede skills on a much earlier recorded performance, which, if I remember correctly, there was a date stamp on that, because old videos used to have a date stamp on it. Mm. And I think that that performance was recorded way, way back before 2001. That could have even been from the 80s. Interesting. So a date stamp, sort of like a camcorder puts on, an old camcorder? Yeah, I don't remember even what the score was. It was just showing you know, the technique that Billy was using to be centipede back then. Whether it was the um, side feet technique or the spider trick, or just Billy flat out playing the game, you know, wrong, I don't remember. But Walter was showing some of Billy's centipede performance back then, because most people never saw a good centipede player. Hmm. Interesting. And this was, but it was direct feed though. Um, yeah, if I remember correctly, that was definitely directly because you could not see anything around the screen itself. It was just the confines of the board. Hmm, interesting. I'm just, uh, my big question is that, and that is then how, not that you have an answer, but uh, how would a camcorder style date end up on something that was a direct feed? I wouldn't know. Um, yeah. But I do remember from the Mall of America event is seeing Centipede playing on the big screen. Walt had the video recorder piped in to whatever big screen uh, they had there. I remember seeing a date stamp on it. That much I remember pretty clear. I think it was a very early date predating 2001 from the 80s. And that's the extent of what I remember. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um... Now, as far as whether or not that was a chi the performance of what was, you know, long attributed to Billy and the teaching of the records, I can't even tell you because I don't know what the score was. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to look up more on that if I can find something uh, after this interview. But um, uh, going back to something you touched on was um, uh, Billy's earlier score. Uh, has he ever said anything about, like, where it was performed or any of the circumstances behind that, the 1.014 million? No, um, all I know is that after Steve Weep um, turned in his million and six score, which was July of 2004, um, first of all, Steve Weep in sequence, it was May of 2004, he turned in a, what was that exact thing? First, the last score was 1.06 million, and then it was, oh, first he turned in 985K, that was in May, end of May, like May 27th. And then around June 29th, June 30th, he turned in 999.5K. <laughs> and then within a few days of that, he turned in the 1.006 million. Now, when that tape came in, and I was watching that, and I actually did a full blown write up of that performance, Billy all of a sudden announces that he has a million and 14 tape. And what Billy did is he announced it at a New York City Lincoln Center mm. event with Walter in tow and a couple of other people. The crowd he proclaims before about 1,500 people in attendance that they said it couldn't be done and laid on Donkey Kong and here's the tape. That's Billy's way of stealing Steve Weeby's thunder. And the tape that was shown at the event, he had a TV set set up in the front of the lobby and the TV set was set up on its side. Do you, I don't suppose you recall the orientation, probably not, of the TV? I remember it. Well, like I said, it was on the side. I had to yeah. Be sideways but, to like, uh, see what he was doing. But back then, again, that was a direct street performance, and we didn't have any specific policies against that back then. And yeah. Billy was, that was the first time the tape was even brought to TG's attention. Billy tells us that he had a conversation with Steve Lee congratulating him on his million, and that he told Steve Lee he had done million and fourteen a year earlier. That's what Billy says, but yeah. who knows? Because Billy's saying a conversation he had with Steve Lee. I didn't hear that conversation. Steve didn't confront the conversation. That's just Billy telling us he had a conversation. As far as when mm. Billy did it, he said it was about a year earlier. Interesting. Billy did it. Most likely he did it at home. Yeah. 
Um, there's this weird event. I got a couple questions relating to this, but like, um, like Steve and Billy were kind of introduced and these posters unveiled and it was going to go to the first person with a recognized million or something like that. Are you familiar with what I'm, what I'm talking about? There was a, um, an event where Walter wanted to uh, do some special recognition for Billy and Steve. I had nothing to do with the event. Mm. It wasn't an event I personally attended, but um, I believe that Walter wanted to, um, as far as, I hate to use this word, he wanted to get rid of all his bad karma. That, that's Walter for you. Walter wanted to do something to formally acknowledge his performance, his performance, and this was it. Now, whether Walter, when he did this, and why he did this, and how he did this, I really remember very little about it. I remember seeing some type of poster about it at some point, but the exact details about this, I honestly can't remember at this point. All right, all right. Uh, my understanding is that it had to do with the early scores that, um, like Steve Wiebe's, um, I forget the exact score, uh, but it was over one million, and that. In the one million six versus Billy's one million fourteen. Yeah, exactly those two. Uh, I remember Billy's scores uh, from researching the case. I never remember uh, Steve's. Uh, but Billy's it... was one point oh six million. Billy's was one point oh one four million. Yeah. I don't remember the hundreds of digits. Sounds about right. Um, and it was like, like they were getting introduced with two posters that basically said that they were going to both be recognized as the first million, but that since Billy said his was first and his was higher, his would be more prominent or something. Yeah, that's the funny thing because I had a conversation with Walter between July and August of both four. Billy was pushing us. Billy was a board of directors member. Billy was pressuring Walter and I that we cannot acknowledge Steve scores the first million because we did it first. I told Walter Steve actually sent in mm. the score first. This is before, by the way, TG opted not to recognize Steve's score because of the events of Brian Crew and Terry Rogers visiting Steve Weave's house mm. and discovering Roy Schultz's involvement. That was a precautionary measure we took at that point not to recognize Scores, but up to that point, before that happened, TG was fully prepared to acknowledge these scores the first million. Billy did not want that to happen, and that's why at the New York City um, Lincoln Center event, he jumped the gun to announce here's a million and fourteen performance, even though it hadn't even been adjudicated yet. But that's Billy's ego for you. And the other thing is, if you remember, he did an MTV segment in year mm. two thousand in which he proclaimed. At some point, he would do the greatest event in video gaming of all time. Billy, back then, was proclaiming to do something no one else had ever done before. He wouldn't give any details in it. And at the Mall of America event in 01, I talked to Billy in the parking lot with Dwayne Richard. And I told Billy, here's what I think you would do, being that I pretty much the same as Billy in terms of age and in terms of uh, video game um, knowledge and expertise to a certain extent. And I said, if I was you, I would probably want to reclaim my Donkey Kong score, get a million, reclaim my Donkey Kong Junior score, get a million, get a new world record on this pack and be the first million, get a new speed record or something on regular pack and um, burger time, reclaim that record. Basically, take all the five records that you used to have back in the 80s, take them all back in one day. And Billy tells me, whoever told you that, you're the closest to guessing what I want to do that anyone else would. So that led me to believe that some of what I said had some resonance and truth to it. So now it comes to 2004, Steve Weeb comes with a million, and Billy Thunder is stolen because Steve Weeb already on Donkey Kong Jr. had a million. And now here's the more eminent title of Donkey Kong, and Steve Weeb gets a million on that. There goes Billy Thunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this big event that he made a big deal about in 2000, he's never done it. Still never done it. And the, uh, the, the, was stolen. And the, uh, the, well, flashing forward a bit of uh, the boomers thing in 2010 where he got the two scores on same day, same day or, you know, claim to have. Could that be, um, could that trace back to that, that claim? That probably was his way of, in some capacity, doing a big effect. In other words, he makes a big production. Oh, I got one record. Let me, while well, I'm at it, try to do another one. And, oh, look at that. I got a second record. 
<laughs> just like that. Yeah. And then as it turns out, uh, a year or two later with Jeremy Young dispute analysis, someone points out that the machine, the board set that's being used to do uh, games, as I understand it from reading the dispute, it was the same board set. Somebody basically pulled a rope to go <laughs> and put the same board set back in or never took it out in the first place. And Billy was playing effectively on the same uh, board for both games. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, for the the um, thrill of being able to announce to people, look, I got two of the world's records for one day. You can go there. Mm-hmm. Which which definitely goes against. He likes to tell the story of like a, you know, oh, you didn't see the forty-seven times I failed. I got up on the ninety-eighth time, but then also has these well, events where he just shows up. And, well, he told me many years ago. Uh, most people only hear about the great scores, but they don't hear about all the you know, dead stars. As Billy says, and a lot of tape players like this. Oh yeah. They play the game out to level four dash three, which is the first big hurdle. If they don't have a certain score by that point, they start again. They play it out to uh, you know five dash <laughs> or whatever it is. They don't have a good score, they start again. They play out to level ten and out of a certain threshold, they start again. Why bother to invest the time into trying to get to a point you know you're not going to reach statistically? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of games that people don't see because of intentional restarts, and then there's the ones that are restarted because of wow, barrel screw-ups. That can happen anyway. Mm-hmm. Going back to this event with the posters, um, I'd like to bring up, uh, I know you're not a big fan of uh, Roy Schilt, but uh, he has a theory about this event. I just wanted to uh, kind of ask you about this theory of his. Oh, uh, his theory was that Twin Galaxies had gotten Steve Weeby to agree to this joint announcement of the two million point records, and that therefore Steve and Billy would both be announced as, hey, they both got a million, sort of at the same time, except Billy claims he got his earlier and his score is higher, which would make Billy's more prominent. And that was sort of a way of pulling a, uh, a rope a dope, as you say, to uh, get Billy's more prominent. And that. It's probably not too far off from what actually happened because a lot of people believe that um, the way that this was all done was semi-orchestrated or even fully orchestrated. It's not that surprise, surprise, Billy had a million points score and surprise, surprise, so did Steve. And granted, Steve did his score in 2004, but the way it was presented and the way they presented both of them, that could very well have been an orchestrated thing. Billy told me once there was some interview where he and Steve were both there and someone was trying to get him to state who did it first and Billy made a point of not answering that question because I think, honestly, they wanted both to be recognized for it, but Billy wanted to basically be in the limelight because if you only want to go with who did it first and it's Steve, well, why do you need to see Billy there? Granted, he had a higher score, but Steve got the million first. It's like, uh, you know, what's that guy's name? The guy Bannister that broke the four minute mile? Mm. Roger Bannister, whatever his name is. No one knows who did it, you know, second, or no one really remembers, but he's the guy that did it first. And Billy did not like the fact that he <laughs> was the guy that got it in his first. Plain and simple. Billy doesn't like coming in number two? No, I mean, kind of like that South Park cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't seen that since all this um, uh, oh, dispute opened up. Trust me. <laughs> I saw it years ago. I definitely want to go back and see it. What was that? It's everything that it's been built up to be. Perfect <laughs> representation of something. <laughs> uh, I want to ask uh, one more thing about Roy's theory is that uh, Steve Weeby was going to go along with it. This, uh, like, oh, we'll announce him at the same time. What was that? Because what happens behind the scenes between Billy and Steve, we'll never know. It's like for KOK, there's a scene of Steve trying to call Billy on a cell phone, and no one's picking up. Mm. Now, that could have been recorded at any time. You know, two weeks before the event, it could have been recorded after the event. You don't know. You don't know. There's no time step on mm-hmm. it. Billy claims that he had no idea Steve was going to be at the event. Yet, lo and behold, this tape shows up, which mm-hmm. is exactly 100,000 points for Steve. Brian is intentionally trying to put the, the video.
video on top of the machine there. <laughs> and Steve ended up coming to play at. Brian had instructions not to show the tape to Steve, even though Billy supposedly didn't know Steve was going to show up. And the whole thing just smells of being orchestrated. So it would be entirely possible for Billy and Steve to have a um, an agreement as to how they're going to have this million point presented at some point. It's entirely possible. Yeah, what's really interesting about Roy's theory, though, is that he says, like, he says, but he says he's the one who, Steve Weeby was going to go along with it. He says he was the one who talked Steve Weeby into saying, no, I don't accept this, and then the event. But the he believes, Roy believes, the posters announcing a million were already made and that the event became, instead of presenting these posters, it was more, as like a done deed, it was more like, here are two posters and whoever wins the race to a million from here will be given their poster. The posters were already made and it was it was turned into like, you know, this weird who will win their poster kind of thing. Unfortunately, I, I have no idea hmm. when Billy makes posters. So he obviously has some graphics designer putting them together. But he's not technically savvy. But as far as the when, as far as when these posters were designed, I have honestly no way to know. There's no way to corroborate was theory or not. It's possible. It's also not possible. There's, there could be some half truth to it. Uh, or he could have stumbled upon a part of the truth. He could have into all of it, or it could just be one time speculation. We'll never know. Hmm. Uh, so, Billy does graphic design. He does all these posters actually himself, doesn't uh, commission them? I don't know. I, I think he, he um, works with the graphics designer and he tells them, here's what I'd like it to look like. He probably has a good hand in it as far as directing the person saying, put this here and make this look like that. But the person that specifically <laughs> does all the layout work, etc. That's got to be a technical person. Hmm. I, mean, I, I doubt Billy even knows how to open up a PDF file. <laughs> um, let's see. What was, um, it's kind of a gap in the story for me, uh, but what was, do, are, do you know what uh, Billy Mitchell was kind of up to in the late 80s, early 90s, or through most of the 90s? Because that's kind of, you hear a lot about what's going on with Walter and Billy, and Walter as well, uh, what's going on with Walter and Billy in the 80s, and then suddenly it starts up when the blue TG book comes out in the late 90s and with the Pac-Man That's Pac -Man kind of one of those areas that has very little documentation. From what little I know, one of Walter's last acts as TG, as a TG um, scorekeeper before 1987 came to an end, was Roy Schultz showed up in Ottawa, Iowa. He was trying to get Walter to formally recognize his claim for Hall of Fame. And Walter basically signed it because Roy was talking to him at that point. Mm -hmm. After that, there was no more TG. Um, so therefore, there was no, there's no internet at that point as far as chatting to TG. So what was happening with Walter and Billy and Chris Ira? I don't know. All of a sudden, 1985-86 comes and this book of records appears on the shelves out of nowhere. Nobody knew it was coming. It just came out of nowhere. I didn't even know it was there until probably six months to a year after it hit shelves. Someone pointed out that they saw it in the Barnes and Nobles, mm. and uh, that's how I found out about it. Otherwise, my last involvement with TG was 1983. Mm. I sent in, I'm oh, sorry, 84, when I sent in my Star Wars performance. That's interesting. Actually, tell me a little bit about how you... Uh, learned about TG, came across, and uh, got involved with them. Uh, I'd be interested well, in hearing well, that. was easy. Back in the um, early 1980s, um, while TG was around, it's not exactly like you know everyone knew what TG was. If you didn't buy those premier gaming magazines back then, Joystick Magazine, Electronic Gaming Monthly, and I don't even think there was any other beyond that. It, was, it wasn't very popular back then, uh, as far as you know, arcade school reporting. If you didn't buy those magazines, you wouldn't even know TG existed. Not like TG advertised in newspapers or had a game show on TV or anything or newspaper articles. If you didn't participate in the gaming event that TG was at or in this event, you wouldn't know TG existed. So had I not seen in late 1983, I saw a score there on Star Wars and 
electronic gaming monthly. If I didn't even see that there, I wouldn't even have bothered to submit a score by it. I wouldn't have known TC existed. Yeah, and uh, were you involved in the um, uh, any sort of adjudication or organizational stuff in the 80s, no. or did that only come until the 90s? No, uh, that I didn't get involved with TG again until I would say the late 1990s. After I had already bought the book, and there was a, I found out there was an online TG forum there, and I happened to send an email to Walter announcing myself as the person who previously uh, set a record in this book. I only talked to Walter once, it was around August of 1984, when he and Steve Harris called me up regarding my Star Wars submission. Otherwise, I never talked to Walter from 1984 until late 1990, without hmm. any reason to. Interesting. And were you on uh, TG staff when uh, Billy had the Pac-Man thing at uh, Fun Spot 99? Oh, I, was, was a, I was a gamer until April of 2001. And in April of 2001, um, I volunteered to host a series of console gaming challenges. And uh, from April of 2001 until July of 01, Walter decided to make me a contributing editor. And he apparently liked what I did. So by August of 2001, he offered me a role as chief referee, a role which previously did not exist. Mm. But Billy's Pac-Man performance from 99, I had nothing to do with the adjudication of that. <clears throat> At the time I was already part of the TG uh, volunteer staff, that school was already in the TG database. Mm. Now we actually, um, when I reached out to you, I said I don't think believe we talked, but then I remembered we actually chatted very briefly. You probably don't remember this on um, something related to Billy Dispute, but we talked about uh, the Pac-Man, the uh, claimed perfect Pac-Man from 1999. And that you had yeah. seen the split screen, but you didn't. Walter, you didn't adjudicate Walter, it. But... What Walter did at some point after I was already chief referee, Walter sent me two <laughs> giant cardboard boxes filled with videotapes. One of which was predominantly an event he ran for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater One and Two, and the other was random TG tapes that had previously been sent to TG. Some of which were adjudicated, some of which were not, and among them was three tapes set with Billy Mitchell's perfect Pac-Man. Now, at that point, I had never seen the kill screen on Pac-Man, never mind the perfect Pac-Man, or had to do a ninth key pattern, etc. So I watched portions of Billy's tapes just to see, well, here's how it's done. I never saw it done before. So I watched portions of his tape, including the very end of it, but I never watched the entire thing. I didn't have to because it's already in the TG database, and... I was under no obligation to co-adjudicate it, so I watched it as a matter of curiosity. It was an over-the-shoulder taping of Billy's performance, and uh, he made a point before every single board of his own and self focus which he found to be comical. <laughs> and what I also found to be comical is he was making cell phone calls towards the end of his performance. I think with Chris Ira, his buddy from Florida, to tell him how he was doing. And when I play a video game, I can't walk and talk at the same time. I'm focused on the game and anything breaks my conversation, I'm going to lose a life. But Billy, here he is playing a perfect game and from what I understand, it wasn't his first attempt during that fun spot today. It was at least a second. Yeah. And here he is making cell phone calls near the tail end of getting his first perfect uh, tape. I never understood that, but that's what he was doing. Now, as, as Billy tells the story, he likes to say that he called... He, he called people when he got to the split screen, and he has said that, that it includes Chris Ira and Walter Day and Rick Fothergill each. Or I think he received a phone call from Fothergill. I um, wouldn't know exactly. You, you don't uh, you know, know exactly. I haven't watched this thing in 14 years. I know only even had the tapes, but he was on the cell phone. Um, I know he received the cell phone call because uh, he would announce the same world record headquarters. Mm. Oh. He making cell phone calls as well as receiving can't remember exactly, but I do know he was on the phone with Chris at some point. That's right, and he uh, he announced uh, Hello World Record Headquarters on that Pac-Man tape? Yeah, he likes to do things <laughs> like that. He did it when he was uh, being filmed for King of Kong. Probably does it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my interest uh, was uh, 
like he, he says like oh I got to the kill screen I called this person and he's listed three different people I'm like how long was this kill screen did he just sit there parked somewhere for 30 minutes taking phone calls before he wrapped it up <laughs> no I think um, the kill screen itself when he got there um, you know, he just kept on playing the game but the kill screen when you get to that right side of the screen where it's just the invisible box left it's pretty meticulous because to be honest with you once you get to that point you really do not want to screw it up. There's so much opportunity to screw it up at that point. Mm. So he was playing game out. I don't even know if there is a way to... No, there, there is a way to park yourself. Because I remember him and Chris telling me afterwards that they tried to see if they can uh, find a way to get past the split screen. And one of the things they tried was leaving the game continuously on for like 30 days. Whoa. So there was a hiding spot in the game. And I think it's towards the end. And that didn't do anything. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I do know that there's a way to mark yourself in that board. But did he do it during his end of that performance? I can't remember for sure. Yeah, and I, and I have seen, because I've watched some uh, split screen things, and uh, there's a place in the garbage side where you can park, and the ghosts are stuck in some phantom channel, and they just they just go through this channel, and you can leave this little parking spot anytime. A little different than the other parking spots on the regular... Boards. It doesn't exactly help you, I guess, except to be able to ask for a break. Uh, less than people would do, normal person would just do that so you can make a cell phone call. But it's really being really close. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, also, to be clear, you've said this before, but uh, uh, everything looked legit as far as you know. The score is what it should be. Well, I never saw a perfect pack, man. I never saw uh, a nice pattern successfully executed at that point, let alone a kill stream. So... As far as I know, it looked legit. I would have no way to compare it to anything else, to be honest with you. I never saw anything else at that point. But it looked like, you know, it was definitely Billy in front of the game, hand on the joystick, playing the game. That that much I'm 100% sure of. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, Billy playing a videotape of a previously recorded performance and mimicking joystick movements. It was definitely him playing the game. Yeah. And, and you... And the fun spot, Gary Vincent wouldn't have allowed any of that bullshit. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> and you having witnessed it mean, means a lot to me as far as uh, giving it credibility, although, of course, since yeah, we were talking I about... I only watched the tape. I wasn't there when he was actually at front of doing it. I watched yeah, the tape. watched the tape. He sent me the tapes in that crate of tapes he uh, sent me like a year or two afterwards, so I am only watching this after the adjudication where it took place by a few years. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the fact that we are talking about Billy Mitchell and that we've proven that he's fabricated other, other evidence, you know, that alone brings things into question. But Right. At that point in time, that wasn't an issue. No one had launched such an investigation against Billy back in 2001, 2002, 2003. It was a non-issue. Mm-hmm. So here's something. Now, uh, Twin Galaxies released their second book of records around 2007, but you weren't with the organization anymore, correct? No. Uh, I was participating before its release in so, certain aspects of proofreading, but I was not part of the final proofreading effort um, because changes were constantly being made along the way. And after I left TG, the remaining staff, whoever else I guess came on board at that point, they had to finish the proofreading efforts before the second book was released. Was a print on demand uh, release, if I remember correctly. Hmm. All right. Now, there's something very interesting I found about uh, Roy Schilt's scores in that that I wanted to ask you about. See if you know. Do are you uh, aware of this weird thing about Roy Schilt's scores in that book? Um, you'd have to refresh my memory because in protest that they both they both my first two books are records back. I just didn't want them anymore. You just oh no! Oh, so you didn't have the books anymore? Uh, I sent, I'm the only person in teaching history who has given Walter Day his books back. <laughs> no. I got so disgusted with him. Oh no, alright. <laughs> um, alright, so um, there were five scores, well, four scores plus a couple on uh, Missile Command, of course. Um, and I'll look for anybody who wants to uh, look them up for themselves. Who's? Uh, oh yeah, I, I guess, I don't know if I discussed, uh, I'd like to put this on YouTube later if uh, that's okay with you. That's fine. Yeah. To my knowledge, Roy scores in the database. He had a missile command tournament score. He had a missile command marathon score. Yep. And any other scores he had, 
most likely were all from the same competition from years earlier. I think there was some competition he played in that Billy and Chris were in attendance on, and there was a couple of games being played there, possibly Cheyenne and a few others, yep. and whatever scores Roy might have had for that event, that probably made it into the book of records, the TG book of records. Uh, you are exactly correct. It was uh, Coronation Day, January 1985. It was, they used to call it Coronation Day. Basically, show up to this event, put on a score, and possibly get in Guinness. Um, so in the second book of TG Records, on page 48, uh, he had a score on the game Cheyenne, 8,899,200. I have them all here. Page 160, uh, score on Karate Champ, uh, 87,400. Page 174... Uh, score on Mad Crasher, 47,044. And on page 249, a score on Return of the Jedi. Actually, no, th- this this one is different. All right, yeah, so Return of the Jedi, 703,410. Now, what... Well, perfectly doable. Yep. And those are all in the first... The, I call it the blue book. I don't have the page numbers for that, but you can look it up pretty easily. Uh, in the second book, those four scores, only one is attributed to Roy Schilt. Are you aware of that? No, I wouldn't have bothered to look at Roy's scores to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, all right, that's fair. Um, the other, this is very curious because I actually sat with the two books side by side and I, I, I kind of went through the arcade scores to see what changed, what got removed, you know, what old scores got added well, that weren't in the first book. What I can book. tell you is I'm not going to point fingers, but um, as far as people changing scores, it was not me. It's not you? All right. Nothing to do with changing Roy's scores. I physically removed his scores from the TG online database. Hmm. I take full responsibility for that, and I don't regret that decision. But as far as the book, I had nothing to do with Roy's scores in the book. All right, all right. I, I would still like to ask you about this, though. Um, so it's the four scores, and uh, the, the Return of the Jedi score is still attributed to Roy Schilt. Um, and I believe that's the only time his name appears in the second book. The other three are attributed to a different name. The scores are still there, still the correct date. Uh, the name they're attributed to is Burton Millward. That's not a name I ever heard of. Oh, interesting. Uh, I did some looking. Yeah, this is very weird, and I googled, and I couldn't find any evidence of anybody online remarking about this. Uh, Burton Millward is a lawyer and an instructor of transcendental meditation at the uh, what is it, Maharai, Maharishi, the thing in Fairfield? Oh, so it's one of Walter's dome buddies, then. Yeah, basically. And a former lawyer, and I thought maybe there was a, some kind of weird, like, they put his... Well, I can tell you, it's most likely, whoever did this, it was most likely not um, a mistake. <laughs> yeah. No way you can make a mistake of that nature. Mm-hmm. That was intentional. Whoever did this was intentional. Now, whether it was Walter or one of Walter's staffers, I can't tell you. I can tell you there's a couple of staffers who would never have done anything that egregious. Yeah. So chances are it was either Walter or someone that Walter had helping in the uh, proofreading process. Could even be at proofreaders doing things after the referees were done with it. We'll never know. And I'll definitely never know because I wasn't part of the final proofreading process. Because you weren't part of it, yeah. I didn't know if maybe the uh, name sounded familiar to you. No, uh, not at all. And to my knowledge, this thing has never even come up before until now. <laughs> no one even made the correlation that Roy scores changed until you just mentioned it. Yeah, and the scores themselves are the exact same and attributed to the same date. It's just the name. And it's it's there's actually another instance of uh, Burton Millward under Missile Command, but uh, that is actually a 2006 score, so that wasn't in the uh, Blue Book. And I, I believe that the Return of the Jedi score is still attributed to Roy Schilt. That was an oversight. They meant to swap all of them and miss that one, is my guess. Well, there's a number of yeah, proofreading mistakes that Walter made in that second book of records. <laughs> this is not a clerical mistake. This is intentional. Intentional, yeah, definitely. And as it blows my mind. Whoever did this, why ever they did this, this is intentional. <laughs> you can't have... Three different scores, all screwed up, attributed to the same mm. name. It doesn't make any logical sense. Absolutely. 
And uh, I figure, and this is just a shot in the dark, that like with Roy's legal threats, maybe uh, this Burton Millward was offering legal assistance, and that was kind of a way of Roy looking in the book to see if his scores were there, saying, call our lawyer, you know, or something like that. Well, I know that Roy had, on a number of occasions, launched legal missives, like, sorry, against TG, but quite honestly, was, was using some fly-by-night lawyer that would send missives to TG, rife with typos and grammatical errors, so we never took them seriously. <laughs> Sort of like, uh, I, I've seen you talk about that, and uh, you compare it to Lionel Hutz on The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much Roy's lawyer in a nutshell. <laughs> the lawyer he had at the time. It was laughable. I remember um, he used to threaten, um, this was post-2005. Tony Temple was a UK player that did special command score. Mm-hmm. And one of the threats that Roy made, this was comical, Tony's in London, Roy's in Los Angeles. Roy threatened Tony that unless he played him head to head on missile command, Roy would proclaim himself the world champion of the title. <laughs> but in all fairness, he will um, pay to have Tony come out to him, he'll pay up to $1,000 to have Tony fly <laughs> from London to Los Angeles to play missile command there. And basically, Tony's saying, boy, why in God's name should I do this? It could cost me $8,000 to come out there. Why should I do this? What's the point? I mean, this is the type of garbage that Roy would pull. And he would do it with a lawyer. Uh, no self-respecting lawyer, no legitimate lawyer would ever sense just stupid leaders of telling someone, you have to play my client in Los Angeles so he'll declare himself champion. I mean, it's just laughable. Mm-hmm. That's the type of stuff Roy used to do. What uh, What is your opinion on um, what Walter Day's legacy will be, positive and negative, perhaps? Well, to be honest with you, I'm a little sad because Walter, he has in the last few years, and I'd say the best way to describe this is because no one denounces it, it just keeps building. Someone at some point in time called Walter the father of competitive video games, the father of classic arts and gaming. Now he's known as the patron saint of competitive video gaming. And it just kept building over the last few years. And I just it just sickens me because Walter is not the father of competitive video gaming. Um, there's video game Efforts that took a uh, contest at Fun Spot in 1979 at Three Dated PG. Mm. There is no father of competitive video gaming, but Walter is being attributed to this, just like uh, Al Gore likes to think himself as invented the internet. <laughs> he never says, No, I'm not. At the same token, you know, he's not uh, coming out and, you know, he's not uh, denying that he is. He's just letting it ride. So Walter's legacy just keeps on geometrically building with every passing year something that he really never did. The only legacy Walter had was he had the presence of mind that this is a hot um, hobby at the moment, and it might be a good idea for nostalgia uh, to start collating scores of who did what. And to that extent, that is his true legacy. He's the first person to meaningfully collate and compare video game achievements. Beyond that, there is really no legacy. And I don't mean to be mean-spirited, but that is Walter's true legacy. Anything beyond that, as far as patron saint this and that, that's just needless accolades. Hmm. And they're not even accurate ones. Is there something uh, positive you might be able to say about Walter's legacy? Is it, uh, I mean, I know that you two yeah, don't so get along, but... There would be thousands of classic arcade gamers that A, would never have come to know each other, hmm. B, would never have learned from each other over the years, and C, that would never have a chance to compete against each other or learn from each other over the years. So that, to me, is the most positive thing I can say about it. If it wasn't for him, what we love about gaming today and what we find enjoyable and memorable about classic arcade gaming today it would have been something that each of us would have just privately have experienced and not shared publicly 
most likely, over the last few decades. It was Walter's original vision that allowed us to get to a point where slowly but surely, uh, competition and sharing and um, you know shared experiences grew over time. That's that's positive comment I could make. Mm-hmm. It's the catalyst for that. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have known who Billy Mitchell is, and I wouldn't have known probably 99.99% of classic arcade gamers. Yeah. I'd like to ask Why you. Any other game for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a topic that is of a particular interest to myself. There was uh, in uh, 2002, I think it was, uh, someone posted on the um, Atari Age forums about uh, Todd Rogers' barnstorming score in disbelief, and people immediately said, well, he's Todd well, Rogers. There was two barnstorming scores that were problematic. Mm. Which one was this? Was this the 32.04, yep. the 32.50, or the 32.67? <laughs> uh, this was the 32.04. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. There are there were, there were a few. And, um, well, I was just hoping you might be able to uh, tell the story. Of... Some light on that. Yeah. Um, at some point, and again, this is way before the modern day disputes took place. At some point, and Todd gave some interviews, and he said that in those early days, it wasn't uncommon for him not to receive a, uh, a prototype cartridge. So Todd said, you know, he did the score, but probably, you know, if people are saying that it couldn't be done in regular cartridge, it's probably because he played the prototype cartridge. And at the time, it's a good word for it, because he had been given prototype cartridges over the years. But some really detailed work was done where someone took the game and they they digitized out the graphics for um, every obstacle to hit. So basically, you just push a button and you fly and you come to a halt at the end. And it basically, it took you 32.04 seconds to cross the screen with no obstacles. So we don't understand how Todd could possibly have done that in legitimate settings, prototypes or not. And the curious thing is Todd has a, um, had a Grand Prix score, another Activision title, where one of his completion scores effectively it's the same thing. It's just holding the start button down to accelerate with no graphics in front and just going straight through the finish line with no skidding over oil marks or hitting any other vehicles. So it's curious that not only has one score that is exactly the amount of time it takes to go from end to end with no obstacles uh, uh, colliding, but he has a second score. Same thing. Mm-hmm. End to end with no collisions. So is it possible that he did these on prototypes? Is it possible that he had somehow a way to do this with no collision detection? I'll never know. But the 32.04, the person that did the math behind that said, that's clearly not possible. And we all agree, it's not. The problem is, is that Todd had two other scores in the database. The way to team the database was unfortunately is it didn't save history of your scores, it constantly overwrote the last score with the better one. So mm. Todd had a 32.50, which I never even saw, but supposedly he did in live in some event. Even that's not possible. But what I did see, by, uh, not live, but a AVI recording it was from the Atari Time Decker event, Todd did a 32.67, which if that AVI I still had, that would be a world's record because the best song I've ever done on the game is the 32.7 range. It's actually so changed I, recently. My song explore would be the world's record if I still had that API file. Now, just so you know, uh, there's actually been some developments on barnstorming and not even just the uh, barn trick. Um, someone by the name of uh, Steam Yams has figured out a way to manipulate the geese a little better. Let me bring up the... Uh, current world record on that. Oh my gosh, it was just there. Yeah, if someone's gotten a much better score, I'm honestly not aware of it. But I know that people are finding out things today, 20, 30 years later, that people didn't know back then. Yeah, uh, Steam Yams currently world record at 32.62 seconds. Jeez. Even better than what Todd did. Exactly. G. Sampson, 32.65. Greg and Roger, both at 32.67 tied at third place. So it's not just one person. That's funny because if you do a Google search on Atari Twin Galaxies Time Decker, mm. you're going to come to a post in the Atari H forum and it's going to have my recap 
of the results of that Becca, and it's going to clearly show Todd Rogers at 32.67 for barnstorming game 1B. I know what I saw. And you know that you saw it. I don't have the ABI files anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and at the time, it seemed yeah. as though that was impossible, but, and, and I didn't... Now you know. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I didn't doubt that you had seen it. I was just like, but now it seems as though... It has something to do with slowing down at a very particular moment when you start, and it changes the whole geese pattern. I haven't looked into it exactly yet, but all these uh, lower scores are, uh, gosh, within, like, the top five scores right now on speedrun.com are all within the last month, or the last couple months. Oh, that, that's amazing. You did not know this. Yeah, still haven't uh, gotten to this uh, legendary 32.5, which they simultaneously oh. claimed wasn't performed in front of people, but was. <laughs> it does prove that the 32.67, which I have adamantly been supporting all these years, it does prove that I saw I could have seen it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of black people tell me, well, Robert's memory is not what it is, or how do we know you saw it unless you have the ABI file? Well, I know what I saw. Yeah. It's very good to hear that somebody could actually do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for telling me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I also wanted, was curious, and all that stuff, so um, uh, Wolf Morrow, uh, who uh, you worked with for many years, um, he says that he was told by a top TG official, I'm sure you know the one, that uh, there was a, a coffee stain on the newsletter, and that was the result of the incorrect time, uh, 32 point seven, uh, gosh, I believe it was 32.74 that was entered as 32.04. Have you ever seen this newsletter coffee stain for yourself? Um, when did TG ever have a newsletter? Uh, it was not a TG newsletter. It was an old Activision newsletter from the 80s. Uh, oh, um, I would know. Um, I mean, these are anecdotes that, quite honestly, I don't recall hearing this one. Um, wouldn't surprise me if I did at one point, but it's not fresh in memory. Um, a coffee stain on a score, I, not something I clearly remember. Mm -hmm. Not something I remember at all. Yeah, because it was, uh, uh, at least this this top TG staffer said that um, they looked into the matter, and apparently Todd's score, like, I, I have looked in the old uh, Activision magazines, and Todd's score is listed as 32.74. I believe I have the number right on that, and that... Over time, that that um, magazine became just a newsletter they would send out, and in one of the issues, that 32.74 became a 32.04, and then that was repeated thereafter, and then that was used as the basis when they were entered all of Todd's scores in. This could be an anecdote that somebody at one four point reported, and to be honest with you, I, I might not even remember if I saw it. It's not something that sticks out in my head. I wouldn't put it past it from being shared with me at one point. This is something from so many years ago. I really don't remember this one clearly. All right. But I definitely don't think I'm the top TG official that would have found this out because I never bothered to look at the old Activision newsletters. Yeah, it was uh, it was someone else. It wasn't you. I, I I know who it is. I'm just not saying their name. The uh, the the person who went to uh, prison a couple of years later. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> um. So um. Well. Speaking of Corcoran, uh, I know this is a very delicate subject, and you are absolutely free to just say, look, I just don't want to talk about this at all. I know that you have pledged to certain people that you would not. No, I can, I can discuss most except for it into my family. Though. All right, cool, cool. I'm mostly um, interested in, um, and, uh, and I, I have worked with sexual assault survivors, so I 100% support TG's decision at the time to not announce um, that this person did what he did to who he did it to, because that is a matter of a uh, uh, victim's agency, survivor's agency, basically. Um, it did eventually get out later. Um, mostly what I'm curious about is how the process went from TG's perspective. Uh, I assume that one day everything was fine and then you got a call from the police. I had a phone call one morning um, from Billy. Mm. And Billy Mitchell told me, uh, I was still teaching senior referee at this point, chief referee at this point. Give me a second. I just had to get a coaster out. Yeah, absolutely. I got a phone call from Billy, and he told me that he heard from um, Brian King or Stephen Knox, I can't remember which, who was a close friend of uh, Corcoran, that Corcoran had been 
arrested at his place of employment, which was a government agency. Mm. And Billy told me what the charges were. And this was like complete shell shock because we had no way to know. I mean, I used to talk to Ron frequently and I'd call him up and more often than not, his daughter would pick up the phone very politely, say, call through in residence. And you know, I'd say, you know, if your dad home, she'd patch it over. And I had no way to know anything was going on. Nobody did. And then Ron, apparently, as I understand it, Ron had been uh, doing things to her over a multi-year period. The sad part of which is Ron's wife, Rhonda, was uh, paraplegic, wheelchair-bound. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Ron was a, um, a ranger, I think, in the uh, military. So mm-hmm. for someone of that background to do this is just horrific. Never mind the fact that he did it to a minor. So Ron's uh, TG uh, involvement at that point was completely severed. And what we immediately decided at that point in time is that we would say that you know, Ron Corker was no longer part of TG and at the request, you know, nothing else was going to be divulged. And I think even at one point we said it was the family's request to leave it at that. We didn't want to go into extreme details. Mm-hmm. And TG got a lot of flack over this from a couple of naysayers on both TG forms, claiming that TG was obligated to give extreme details because people he might have contacted outside of his family, but we did not see that as being a problem uh, because he really didn't deal with any minors outside of uh, you know his own daughter, really. And um, mm-hmm. not that uh, he did anything nice to her, but uh, we decided to keep it private because, as I understand it, the wife and Order, they moved at some point very quickly out of that locale and they went somewhere else to disappear into society as somebody else. They probably changed their names and the girl probably went through counseling. So, last thing TG wanted to do was to give extreme details about this mm-hmm. because we didn't feel benefited on anyone at that point. I mean, it would just satiate curiosity and nothing more. Yeah. So we thought that the matter was internally resolved. Um, as far as sharing levels of details of what happened and why. And then it just left the administrative side of things, which we had to deal with internally, shutting off his access and dealing with the police taking so much of TG's property, which largely was never returned. And uh, it was just a mess. Plus the fact that at that point he was behind bars. It wasn't like he wasn't he wasn't about to hurt anyone else. And... No, and the funny thing is, and I will say this as a matter of record, Walter encouraged Todd Rogers and myself to maintain communications with Ron mm. Preston. Todd and I flat out refused to so much as to keep the man alone. Nothing. We never contacted him. I never will. Todd never will. You know, regardless of what Todd's gaming yeah. was as far as a record holder, we would not deal with Corker at that point. Whether Walter did, because I quite honestly think he probably did, that's his own business, but I wasn't going to deal with that monster. And I, and I do have respect for Todd for uh, taking that position. Um, uh, uh, my understanding is that Walter has... Well, I guess it comes from you that Walter has maintained communication with him, at least for uh, with Corcoran. At least probably for some did. Point. Probably did. Because he encouraged us to. Yeah. And no doubt he probably did himself. <clears throat> uh, this was kept private, as we discussed. It did eventually get out. Did you have anything to say about how it was eventually revealed and publicized? or? At some point a few years later, the forums... Uh, as to say the war cries in the forums reached a great end up. And certain information at some point was released that Corcoran did in fact do things he shouldn't have done. And also, I believe at some point, somebody, uh, can't remember who, they posted in the forums, look what I found on the Florida, Cor- the Florida Correctional Facility site or Arizona, Arizona Correctional Facility mm-hmm. site, and they posted a picture of them with the link. So, you know, cast out of the bag. Yeah. We're down at that point what he did. So certain details were at some point shared. Um, but beyond that, the extreme details, such as how long he had been doing it and other things, 
nobody needs to hear details like that. I mean, that, that's like absolutely. the late night uh, TV or something. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, on the subject of Todd Rogers, uh, I mean, obviously, there, there's any number of scores that <laughs> are just are flat out impossible. I believe you cited Kaboom as one that it was mind-bogglingly well, impossible. Not Kaboom per se, but Kaboom came one a mm. score of nine hundred. What the hell was the score? God, it was ridiculously high. Nine hundred and sixty thousand and one point. That score is beyond impossible. Beyond impossible. And it has to do with basically getting an extra life at the rollover and then... The, the, there's a specific sequence of events that must take place in order for you to get a score of that exact amount. And after playing the game out for so long, one of two things could happen. Either you got tired or your joystick broke. Now, for that sequence of events to take place exactly to get that score, it's not a matter of the joystick breaking. Mm. And for you to get tired at that point after playing out with that level of absolute perfection for nearly five straight hours, it's inconceivable that someone who supposedly played Journey, Journey Escape for 84 hours got tired after playing the boom for four and a half plus. <laughs> it just doesn't shine. Just doesn't, yeah. I guess, well, but the question I want to ask is I want to get your thoughts on, um, uh, I, I think it's pretty known, pretty much assumed with Billy that he knows what he's doing, that he's not ignorant of what he did. Would you agree? I believe that Billy is a person that believes that no publicity is bad publicity. So whatever he did, the fact that it's discovered doesn't make a difference. He's going to turn a negative into a positive. He's going to find the silver lining in it. And he doesn't even have to acknowledge that he did something bad. That's my best assessment of Billy. Yeah. Um, Todd, it seems, is a little more murky. Uh, there's some debate online as to whether Todd really believes his claims. What do you, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, I, I did give an interview once where I came up with my own assessment on it. You have to think back to the early 1980s. Todd was just, he's around my age. We were both late teens. We were practically uh, 1981, um, 17, 18 years old range. You have, for the very first time, you have something that you're physically good at as far as quantifying it against your peers. And in fact, it's actually documented against your peers. So there's personalities that are satisfied with saying, look, I'm number three, I'm number five. Uh, some will say, wow, I'm number one. Um, Todd might be a personality where he has to be number one. Mm. Who's not good enough? Um, and then it's possible, well, it's not just a matter of being number one by point or two points. I'm going to be number one by a crushing margin. So it's entirely possible that once the presence of senior name in the Activision newsletter became a reality, and seeing it there as number one on this title and maybe tied on that and number one on this, it's possible that it got taken a step or two too far. That it wasn't nearly enough being the person on top. You had to be a legend on top. It's hmm. possible that they carried away with it. In the research on this, I came across the old Picture House forums, which aren't active anymore, but a lot of the pages are on Internet Archive. And you and By post the way, I am a teacher one on the Picture House forums, just so you know. Oh, really? Yeah, I created a second persona. Oh, that's... And if you look at the Donkey Kong forums, <laughs> Wong is me. <laughs> that, that, that's really interesting, actually, because I, I, I've seen Teacher Wong... Like, few people have noticed this. <laughs> that is so cool. Because I see, wow, Teacher Wong seems uh, pretty to know a lot of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that, that's me. That's me. That is so cool. Thank you for admitting that. I, I, I really appreciate right, well, that. Welcome. There's a little gem out there. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Oh, man, I wish I could. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll look back to this and stuff actually, later. The funny thing is, the one that found me out of the zone, not through any computer search, but he's looking at what this person was writing, he was blank. that said, is that you? No way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. That's great. 
Um, there is one post by you under your name, I noticed. And unfortunately, it was one I was really interested in seeing. It had like a whole bunch of replies to it, but that one was not saved on the archive yet, as far as I found. Yeah, we were defending Billy Truth and Nail back then. Yeah. Because at the time, right after the Gina Carlton movie came out, people were blasting Billy left and right. Uh, basically, it was like he was some like evil monster trying to prevent you from getting his accolades, and we were defending that because we, we did not see him that way at that time. Mm-hmm. We were looking at, you know, everything that he did was so good for the, uh, the TG organization, so good for gaming as a hobby. We did not see any animosity or any bitterness in him at that point, so we, we defended him. Yeah. And we was, only one that defended him. Mm-hmm. And it was definitely my understanding that Dwayne was defending Billy in 2007. I wasn't able to bring up something like concrete to point to in time for posting the thing I did a couple of days ago. But. We all initially defended him because Billy would say he never saw the movie. He doesn't go onto the forums. <laughs> we would tell him what we see on the forums. And he would tell us in some cases, what well, can you post? Can you do that, et cetera? Oh. So anything in writing was always verbal with Billy because Billy likes to be behind the scenes, pulling the puppet strings. Mm. That's Billy. Interesting. Uh, it brings another question, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, uh, but yeah, and wasn't Dwayne's... So Dwayne ended up producing a video called King of Khan, and it's my impression that that was originally going to be... I mean, Dwayne is not a fan of Steve Weeby or the King of Khan filmmakers, well, but... There's, there's two things that you need to know. For starters, the original video product that Dwayne did was not the King of Khan. Dwayne started by blasting Steve Weeby's performance. He was hell-bent on proving that Steve Weeby was cheating and manipulated the board set. He turned off the collision detection by a little and a whole bunch of other things. Mm. But eventually, Billy, uh, Dwayne got sick and tired of Billy. And he completely switched gears. And he um, changed the focus of his film project to be anti-Billy. Mm, yeah. But at one point, it was going to be very much standing up for Bill, right? Yeah, Dwayne changed his position at a certain point because you know, Billy was just, um, well, we took it for face value and uh, we took it for granted because we'd known him for a while and we had no reason to doubt him that he would do anything malicious or anything like that. But all of a sudden, anecdotal evidence would point that Billy did something and eventually Dwayne wised up and changed his gears and no longer defended Billy. I myself was no longer defending him at a certain point after 2007. Um, and then Dwayne came up with his film project. Uh, he won some money because of a cash settlement he got from a, a fortunate event he suffered in Los Angeles, as I understand it. Mm. And he used that money to fund this film project. And he eventually made it perfect for him. as you can now obtain it, I guess, from wherever you can download it online. Uh, since you mentioned this uh, unfortunate incident in Los Angeles, would this be the uh, police thing that's mentioned in Man vs. Snake? Or? Yeah, he got, he yeah. was, as I understand it, he was at, attending some concert or something, or nearby a concert. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He got a severe beatdown. He shared a couple of pictures of it. And uh, the way he was treated by the Los Angeles Police Department, was completely inappropriate. Mm. As I understand it, he eventually scored some settlement from it, 40,000 range, I think, and he used that to fund his uh, film project. Mm. Um, back to the Picture House forums, there was one post, uh, it was called King of Kong's Factual Errors Annotated and Time Indexed. And I was like, oh, yeah, Ooh. I did that myself from Walter. There was a point in which I took the DVD and I mapped it out second by second exactly what was wrong with King of Kong, both what I believed to be wrong and what I knew for a fact was wrong. I mean, I went all out on this one, including how they screwed up the continuity of the uh, scenes, because I was I knew for a fact back then, I actually have an Excel file I saved on this, what t-shirts I was physically wearing per day. And I can tell from the sequence of events, uh-huh. one spot uh, event of the movie, that they showed me completely at the sequence. And I also mapped out on uh, the popular events section of King and Kong, 
how that was the worst possible bit of editing on the entire movie that you can imagine, and a whole bunch of other stuff that's wrong with it. Basically, the King of Kong had clerical errors and factual errors galore. Like twenty percent of it is completely us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and funny thing is, if you watch the uh, Pompano event, there's a point where Walter tells Steve he has to play one more game. Donkey Kong, as you know, you start with three lives, you get one extra. Mm. Watch the DVD carefully. Steve dies like five times. <clears throat> on top mm. of that, if you look at the scores that are displayed on the game at various points, and if you look at that chronology yeah. that's in the picture house form, you're going to see that some of the scores from earlier in the movie appear later in the Pompano event. It's the same scores. Oh. They show some, you know, they show like what the leaderboard looks like at some point when there's three scores on it, and then it shows back to where it was when there was one score on it. Basically, it's all the same game. Oh. And there's uh, illusions. Like, there's a scene where I think it was somebody, Steve Sanders, is on the phone talking, and they're talking about. You think they're talking about Steve Wee playing the game, but they're not. They're talking about Donald Hayes playing Joust. There's oh, a whole yeah. bunch of other stuff that they threw into the movie to kind of misdirect you. They, they filmed me in the front spot talking about the, um, um, when things get tough in adjudications, we send in the professionals and they segue to Brian Koo and Perry Rogers going to Steve Wee's house. What they clip off is the rest of the interview that says when things get tough, you have to call on the experts who actually play the game at that level so we can show them the tapes to find out is this even possible, such as Chris Aaron and Dr. Trump. So they leave things off in the movie to bolster their side of presentation to craft a point of view that, you know, Billy's the bad guy. And we defended him up to that point mm-hmm. in the picture house forms. We had no reason not to. Yeah. You've definitely uh, spoken a lot uh, everywhere and here about the errors in King of Kong. I was wondering if you possibly had on some old hard drive somewhere the text of I that still, post. I still have that. Oh, yeah. I'd love yeah, to see that. Well, yeah. All you need to do, I, I forget. Did you already send me your email? I don't remember. Uh, I haven't yet. I'll, I'll give that to you. Send me the email via TGPM. Uh, my email address is... Uh, well, I don't know yeah, yeah, exactly. If we're posting yeah, on this YouTube, a, yeah. Send me a TGPM, your email address, so I can email you this file, because I still have it. Yes, absolutely. I would love to see it. I saved everything. I even saved the original Bill versus Steve, one million points, first million points on Donkey Kong article I wrote. It's like 40 pages long. I still I, saved that, too. I think I have seen that. I think it came up in the dispute, yeah. Yeah, we were fully prepared to actually release that until two days before uh, when we found out that um, Brian and Terry Rogers found that uh, gummy substance, which is a whole other conversation, on one of Steve Weep's board sets, and they found Roy Schultz's name there. And I do want to say publicly that that gummy substance thing, that is not something I came up with on my own. Mm. That is something that after Brian Coon discovered it there, Billy and Chris Iron told me on the phone, that the gummy substance on the board is not supposed to be there. And it's supposed, it potentially could affect the clock speed and the way the game plays. And being that I'm not technically savvy, I have to take their word for it because they're the experts. So that's the source of the gummy substance comment. Hmm. It came from them. From, yeah. Except, well, everybody who saw the movie believes it's you. I take saying it to a videographer. <laughs> the, the person I'm saying it to, that's not even the King of Kong recording team. That, that's oh, right. Joshua Ross Tuttle, who was doing his own film, mm. and then Ed Cunningham has set forth for his footage and incorporated it into their film because it supported the storyline that they were trying to make. Yeah, actually, um... The guy's name Tuttle in the DVD, if you cue it to the end of the credits, you're going to see the guy's name there. Tuttle. That's why his name is in the credits. They bought his footage. Yeah. Do you, do you have any other interesting stories? Because it, it is known that, uh, the there were a bunch of different crews that ended up selling their footage to both King of Kong and Chasing Ghosts. Why would I can tell you for a fact? Because that one was filmed at my place of employment. It's on your Dyer Street in New York City. Hmm. And the King of Kong people never came to New York City. Yeah. Any other interesting stories regarding uh, different film crews that dropped away? There was two film crews there. I don't even remember what happened to the second one because all of a sudden at that event, three film crews popped up 
Now, the at Cunningham film crew, they weren't there to film King of Kong per se. Mm. We were told they were there to film a retrospective on gamers from the here and now, um, how they feel about how gaming has developed, what they've been doing over the years. Basically, they were, they had this group, this unfocused you know, sense of direction, and they didn't really know for sure what their final film product was going to be. It worked with the King of Kong, so we're told. But some people believe that they knew all along it was going to be about Billy versus Steve and about certain bad things about TG. Mm. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence over the years that points to that. The other film crew guys, they had their own budding film projects because all of a sudden everything was, you know, there was a big interest in classic arcade gaming in 2005 for some reason. King Kong hadn't even come out yet. And all these guys just suddenly showed up at Unspot's doorstep, but they were all working independent of each other. Some of them were there to get dirt on TJ specifically. It was really disgusting. Mm. There was one instance um, where one of the film crews, and they did this on me actually, and they did this on one other gamer, they did not take mics off that we were wearing. We we're not accustomed to being interviewed, so we forgot we were wearing the mic. Mm. We were wandering around the agency, uh, sorry, the uh, event area. And we're talking to this and that, and they're capturing the audio of what we're saying. Oh no! Because we we, didn't, we forgot that we had a mic hooked up. Oh no! Did yeah. that end up getting used or? Yeah, and and they got information. They didn't use it, oh. phones, but they knew that there was things going on. So they were definitely mostly interested in some of the stuff involving CG and um, Steve Weed, and also. Uh, TG and Pat Rashman, who had a budding Miss Pac Man Wills record that was in the process of being reviewed, which TG also had improved, also because of Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell was trying to squash that performance. So was Chris Ira. Yeah, I was about to ask it, you about the Abner Ashman story. Abner came out of the blue, and Abner was basically a junior Pac Man player. And he was the first player, I think, to got half a million on Junior Pac Man. And, and also, he got a 900 and, I forget, 20 something thousand. He beat Chris Ira's record by a few hundred points on Miss Pac Man. And the thing with Abner is Abner got, in Miss Pac Man, you get to a certain board, and then there's a number of kill screens that comes up. And the number of kill screens could be one, two, three, four, or eight. Abner got three games in a row with eight kill screens mm. each. Billy Chris and Rick Fothergill combined over 20 years only had about seven games between them that had eight kill screens in them. So they were wondering how Abner got eight kill screens in a row three times in a row. Um, so I had Abner's board checked out by a recognized industry expert. They also paid, and this was at my own expense, I paid to have Darren Harris's board checked out. And then they came back to speak from Lupine Systems with a good thumbs up. Abner was using, and again, I'm not a technical person, he was like, he was doing the equivalent of using a DC board in an AC environment with an adapter in between. And the guy said, well, from a purist point of view, it's not the same, of course, but from a gameplay point of view, I can't see how it possibly changes the outcome of the performance. And Billy and Chris were trying to say, no, nope, can't accept it, it's not statistically possible, don't accept it, and Walter and I accepted it anyway. Because Billy was trying to use the weight of the board of directors uh, influence on us, and I wouldn't have it. Mm. So Billy was basically trying to squash his score, just like it was apparent that he was trying to squash Steve Wheaton's. So Apparently, some of these um, videographers through the um, mics that we had hooked up to us, they got wind of this. And they were actively trying to get, as we said, dirt on TG. And one of them, and Brian King and Walter and I were going to go to the cabin with Abner and Darren to hash it out. They were outside, and they had those mics pointed directly at the window. You know those long mics that pick up sounds from 60 feet away? Yeah. And these guys, they were getting sneaky. They even <laughs> got... Um, they were at Sunspot posting signs all over the place saying, you will be photographed, if you're in this area, you will be photographed as part of the film project. They will put these signs up even without permission of Sunspot Mary. <laughs> Something that Gary Vincent shut down immediately. Mm -hmm. I told Walter they had these signs up for 40 minutes. There's no way to know what footage was filmed within that 40 minutes. So legally speaking, you don't know how much of this footage was authorized or not. You can use this in the court of law to shut down King of Kong, but Walter didn't bother Joe. Yeah. My belief is Walter and Billy wanted King of Kong to go out. Because if you think about it, 
Oh. Why would Billy, years later, have the King of Kong arcade set up in the Florida airport mm -hmm. using the very same poster showing Walter and Billy, uh, sorry, Billy and Steve Hyde? Walter and Billy knew damn well what was going on all this time. Orchestrated. Billy wanted King Kong to come out. When Walter pressured us to sign the, uh, uh, what's that called, those um, agreements? Life with, rights agreements? Rights. Yeah. When you sign that agreement, like you participate in the film, whatever it's called, Walter pressured us into signing it without even telling us that Roy Schultz was going to be part of the film. I have seen where Billy has said that it was his impression that Roy Schultz was the, that his his signing of that was contingent on Roy Schultz being excluded, and then he discovered later that the Roy Schultz exclusion only pertained to the remake. I don't believe that, because Walter mm. was pressuring us to sign it. And I found out a week after I signed it that Roy Schultz was going to be in it. Billy's the one that even told me that. Oh. I don't believe anything that comes from Billy's mouth. <laughs> yeah. So you think uh, he uh, Billy signed it knowing Roy Schultz would be in the movie? Billy was getting paid. We weren't. Mm. But still, with all of us, couldn't be used unless we signed these things. The amusing thing is, as I understand it, Queen didn't even sign an NDA, and yet Dwayne did the film. Mm. I think Greg Irwin the same thing. He's in the film. He never signed an NDA. But all these little things like that, legal issues that Walter could have used to put an injunction in the film, he would bother because they wanted that film to come out. It's publicity for Billy. Like I said, most, no publicity is, you know, bad publicity. That's the way Billy is. That's why with this Road to Redemption tour, even when they're, they're mm. having musicals about Billy Mitchell cheating on Donkey Kong, <laughs> he's still showing up in attendance. Why mm. would you do that? Interesting. Yeah, and I've also thought because... Um... Not to spoil the Pixels movie, but there's a character based on Billy, and things happen, and uh, just like, and Billy fully participated in the, partic in the uh, publicity for that as well. I don't, I don't remember or even know if he participated in the publicity, but that's guaranteed. That's a takeoff on Billy that he didn't control. Yeah, and Billy was definitely on a panel. I don't know the whole story behind that on a panel uh, promoting the movie. It's on YouTube. It surprised me. I, I really did not. Uh, the only involvement I knew that Billy had in the movie was his likeness. I had no idea what beyond that the first time hearing of it. And to be honest, I haven't even actually seen the movie yet, but I, I'm familiar with uh, you know certain it's events. It's not a bad movie. It's not a bad movie. Yeah, I, like it. I, I definitely would uh, like to see it at some point. Um, since we're talking about Billy's Road to Redemption, what was your uh, impression? I assume you probably maybe watched his uh, hour-long panel at uh, Southern Fried Gaming Expo where he's waving around the stack of papers. That that, new, that little panel where I think there was a Black Wolf yep. there as well, Bobby Black Wolf, yep. he's someone I actually met in 2004. I'm hmm. surprised that he remembers that. I was talking to him about it uh, by an uh, internet chat, uh, uh, Facebook chat, or whatever it was, and he remembers that. And um, he was sad that he was on this panel and really couldn't say what he wanted to, because the minute it started, Walter and Billy pretty much commandeered the entire discussion. That was annoying. The whole thing is basically to make Billy look good. Mm -hmm. He's in full damage control mode now. Everything he's doing is damage control. Mm -hmm. In some cases, he's just making it worse for himself. <laughs> he did something, as I understand it, that part where he had that guy that helped him with the board set um, at that event where he got two Donkey Kong records. He had the guy come out and basically show or explain how he did it. And then the real, you know, the experts are looking at this and they're saying, you know, that doesn't help the case. It makes it worse. <laughs> Yeah, there were a few things like um, uh, Carlos Pinero, who eventually did come out and say, yeah, there's no way this video came from Arcade, but uh, he was providing evidence that was supposed to prove Billy innocent, and then people looked at it and said, no, that actually is just more proof that he's guilty. See, the thing with Billy, Billy is, he is a good Donkey Kong player. The problem is, he has to be the best. It's not good enough for him to be second best. This is one of the reasons why you'll notice that what Billy does Throws his game off at a certain point. They get to a certain point, so you know he's a great player. But does he really have the chops to take it to the 1.15, the 1.2 level? No, 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 because he, he doesn't. He doesn't know if he can do it himself. So he throws his game off early. It's a way of saying I'm good, but you'll never know how good. Hmm. Interesting. Never thought of it quite like that. No, no 
self-respecting world record player in a video game, in a finite completion game, will kill a game in progress just because they can. That's not arrogance. Not at all. An arrogant player is a player that can't get 12 million, but he'll only put up 11 just for the hell of it. That's arrogance. This is a finite completion game with a finite number of boards. Billy does not want people to see how good he can do. Mm. He does not. I don't think he wants people to see that because the minute he shows, here's the best I can do, Robbie Lakeman will come and get a million two forty seven, which Billy cannot do. Mm, yeah. That way it's always kind of a mystery. Yeah. Do you think that he has perhaps tried himself in private to see how well he can do? Probably he did. Like he probably knows he cannot get past a certain point. There are certain gamers in the classic arcade game genre, I know for a fact, during a competition of 10 titles, where you get a percentage awarded per title based on your score relevant to the top score on the event for that title. So if the top score is 1,000, you get 900, you get 90%. There's some gamers that will play eight or nine of the titles in the event. But if they know for a fact they're not going to finish your number one, they will not play that 10th title. Mm. Because they don't want people to see that they, they finished, they qualified, but they only came in third, fourth, fifth. They don't want people to see that. Mm. So they'd rather submit good scores on seven, eight, nine games out of the 10, but not even bother with the rest. It's an ego thing. Hmm. Like I said, some players have to be number one. Yeah. What are your uh, thoughts on the Twin Galaxies dispute process and how the Todd and Billy disputes were conducted so openly? Well, um, to be honest with you, Jace Hall, as the current manager and custodian of GG, he has a standing policy of full transparency, which initially um, I was vocal against for a number of reasons, but uh, over time, um, this policy became the way to go, and I acknowledge that. Not that it needs to change because of how I feel, I'm just one person out of many, but it seems to be best for the current state and community climate. And for all of these things to be openly resolved and openly discussed, um, it may be a little unsavory to some, but the greater, I'm not going to say it's the greater good, but the greatest sense of accuracy and closure is that when all the experts have had a chance to chime in publicly, this way there's no doubt as far as what the outcome is. I think that that's what works in this case. And in the Todd case, more so than the Billy case, there was more evidence that Todd didn't do certain things. And I think my post, and I hate to sound like this, my post was the final nail in the coffin. Mm-hmm. If you look at the Todd dispute, right after my post, Jay locked the thread. Yeah, and uh, they... I, I was actually about to ask you about that as well, because they had initially announced that the resolution of the dispute would be, I think, March 31st of last year, and then well, they got... This, this is, this is going to be, you know, this is going to come out publicly, I don't really care at this point. Yeah. Um, I had an agreement. Uh, I wrote um, that uh, I had a, a pending post I was going to make, and it was going to be a really long one, lasting, uh, because I, I pretty much had it at that point, and I was going to say, here's what I know, and that's my last post. And I sent the prelim of it to uh, Jason, who read it, and basically at that point, that was the final nail in the coffin. There was nothing more to use, so he told me, here's what we're going to do, um, post this thing tomorrow morning, and as soon as it's posted to the site, I'm going to lock the thread and put TG's final comments on it, and that would be that. So at 8.35 a.m. in that morning, I posted that right before I went to work. I you know, did that, sent Joseph's Facebook note saying it's done, and then Jace locked the thread, and that was the end of the discussion. Because Jace read what I posted, and the evidence was just, you know, in his own words, damn it, and it mm. was. And a lot of what I revealed, it was for years, going back when I was still a referee, it was questions I had about some of Todd's specific scores. What in a professional felt means I couldn't understand how physically possible anyone could have done these scores. Happened to be Todd. And he never got back to me on any of these scores. It was always one reason or another why he couldn't show me copies of the tapes or even portions of them. And couple that with all the other allegations against him over the years. Uh, and then there was the way he was entering the scores in his database score count was just going up in a leech and unchecked. It was just way too much. So Jace made the call that, you know, enough is enough. That was that. Between the barnstorming score and all the others, the 
drags to scroll, which is the primary thing in the debate, uh, was Todd's own words. He did a, an interview with someone that programmatically tried to duplicate what he did. He just didn't jive. And I'm the gamer who started the debate. His systematic program of duplicating the way Gregster's program works, that only yielded a certain result, which could possibly have been the Todd's long-time stories, of, anecdotal stories of how he did it years ago. They just didn't jive in terms of taking them and applying them in a controlled environment. I mean, people took it on good faith for years that this is what he did. We tell people, you know, playing dragster, his big secret is I popped the clutch. And back in 1982, well, you didn't have a computer that you could um, take dragster and, you know, reprogram it in such a way that you could have a program map out section by section what was going on. No one could disprove what Todd did until now. And so his stories for the years were consistent. They just unraveled. Mm -hmm. And Dragster, as it turns out, was just the tip of the iceberg. Just unfortunately the most famous club that he's had. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've gone back and looked at other people talking about the record, and there were people even a few months before on the Gamers Analysis not saying it's definitely untrue, but just like, wait, nobody's gotten this in 35 years? Somebody said, that smells sus to me. I had personally defended Todd's score for years. I had even said publicly it's one of the top five greatest gaming achievements of all time. I was firmly behind it the whole way until this Army Gamers analysis came up. I had no way to disprove it because I'm not even a great dragster player. I don't even think I've ever broken six seconds. Hmm. The best I ever did is like a 6.1 something. It's hard. I think I got under six seconds, but I've been uh, trying myself, and it is, is not as easy as it looks. Oh, yeah. Um, it was the Ben Heck show that Todd did. If you watch that, and he was with Ben Heck for two days, everything unraveled to that point for him. There was nothing he did that made sense. Mm hmm. Plus, uh, and at first it was just about Dragster, but then all of his other scores started getting looked at and talked about. Well, I, I had for years, I had a small roster of specific scores that I had asked Todd to come up with bona fide proof on how he did it. And in some cases, like the Kaboom, I said, I don't need to see the whole five hours, Todd, or whatever it is. I just want to see the last six seconds. Wouldn't even give me that. It was always, I have, you know, it's buried in or 500 dates in my house, etc. I never understood how we couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. There have been... Uh, here, let me ask you something. Uh, you're you're familiar with uh, the guy named uh, Triforce, and he has... Not, not my favorite game, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, he's... Uh, he, of course, he's defended Todd, defended Billy, and he... Has... Well, there's a reason for that. Do you that? know what the reason is? Uh, well, Billy gives him money all the time, pays for plane well, tickets and stuff. Do you, do you know what the Council of Legendary Gamers is? Oh, I've heard of this. The not, Legendary Gamers? I'm not sure. Walter formed it was Billy and Todd and um, the, uh, Triforce and uh, what the hell is that guy's name? Fatality um, and a couple of other people. Basically, it's the best of the best of the best in the money system. They just all back each other up. Except for fatality, because he's smart enough not to stick his nose in this anymore. But all the rest mm -hmm. of them, Ben Gold and Triforce, Billy and Todd, Steve Sanders, they'll back each other up. Yeah. And the amusing thing is, when you think about it now, who's in this little bandwagon? Billy Mitchell, fraud, Todd Rogers, fraud, Steve uh, Sanders, fraud from years ago, Triforce, he's had some issues. <laughs> no, it really makes you wonder. Yeah, very much so. Uh, uh, and and Triforce hasn't, you know, there's there's he's always kind of had a, a plausible excuse for things, but definitely a lot of like, hmm, that, that seems weird, you know. There's, there's some people, you know, when you accuse them of one thing and they have an excuse that's one thing, but I mean, well, it's like, you know, I'd hate to get political, but there's certain politicians where there's so many allegations against them 
every single one of them got one flimsy excuse after another, like our New York City mayor. Eventually, you have to ask yourself, I mean, you know, I could see one instance or two instances, but not like 10, 20, 30. Eventually, one person cannot have that many flimsy stories. They're all true. Yeah, not even just about... That's just credibility. Yeah, very much. And not even just about video games with Triforce, but about all these interpersonal interactions. Like, all these people have problems with him. You know, but it's all their fault and not his. story about Triforce? Oh, I'd love to hear your story. Okay, true story. First time I meet Triforce. I show up at a fun November vacation. And typically, I go every third week in November. And Triforce apparently was there waiting for me to meet me. But he got his dates mixed up. So on my first day of arrival... How was his last day of departure? <laughs> and so the funny part is, how do I meet this guy? He's sitting in the back of fun spot on the upper floor, and he's got his power glove on. So mm. he sticks his hand out for me to shake his hand, and he's holding his hand out, palmed out. Like I'm going to kiss his power glove or something like that. So I took his hand, I twisted it sideways, and I shook his hand. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, what an arrogant shit. <laughs> Mm. That was my first meeting in Triforce. <laughs> Your first impression. Yeah. Yeah, he has said that he is willing to believe that the 5.51 didn't happen if we sit if we set up an actual Atari with an actual input simulator and run through every single possible combination, input combination, which would take I, like 30 years or something. And then he says... Well, that's, oh. that's a, not 30 years. He's, he's just pulling numbers out of his ass. Yeah. Effectively, only gamers are really dumb. There's only so many combinations. Considering the game, it was only got like seven or eight hundred lines of code. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been decompiled. It's a very simple game. There is not 30 million combinations that you have in a six-second performance. Yeah, but he, he, he want, he's not satisfied with the like theoretical spreadsheet analysis. He wants actual hardware testing for each of those possibilities, each of those combinations of pressing any button at any time. Well, yeah, he can <laughs> keep dreaming. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on uh, the TG SAP? The way, because uh, you, when you worked, it was private referees, private, um, like, strategies were kept private. There's a plus and minus to that method. Uh, the plus method is you had a bunch of concerted individuals, granted they're not getting paid for it, and their focus was to look at these tapes. Now, the plus side is things got done a little faster. Minus side is it was a limited amount of expertise looking at it. Instead of having you know, 12 referees, now you got potentially one, two, three hundred people looking at the same performance. It's a trade-off. One way might work better than another. The old way, we were able to preserve the anonymity of the performance. The current way is full transparency. There's pluses and minuses to that. When it comes to pattern reasons, people don't want to share their hard work pattern because they feel, why should I take a world record that I had to invest 30 years of hard work in? Somebody's going to look at this and in the space of five minutes, they're just going to duplicate what I do. Time. It just doesn't seem fair, but the new full transparency teaching that allows. Hmm. So there's pluses and minuses to both methodologies. I happen to like certain elements of old TV just as I like certain elements of current TV. All right. What do you feel about um, just, in fact, the very idea of preserving secret strategies, even setting aside the fact that people were able to um, cheat the system like Todd Rogers? Um, and that used to be TG's policy of preserving... There's legitimate ways that people have gotten world records without cheating, and it's through hard-fought discoveries, um, through hard work, that believe that they're entitled to the privilege of keeping their performances secret. I happen to know of uh, an arcade performance, which I adjudicated, where someone used a point-pressing strategy. Now, that's different than leeching, because point-pressing is generally the happens in a limited duration game, such as a game with a clock timer. So you have to get as many points as you can within a fixed amount of time. So we found out a unique way to press points, which has never been done before. It's perfectly legit. It's so common that anyone could do it. It's just no one ever thinks of it. And I preserved that little discovery that they made all these years because that was what they wanted. And as a result of that, because of new TG, if anyone ever breaks the world record score, gamer is not going to come back and 
they claim it because if you do that, they will have to divulge what their best uh, tactic is. Mm, interesting. There's a couple of performances like that where a tactic was discovered which is perfectly legit, it's not cheating, and the gamer's secret is preserved because that was their wish. The current PG does not allow for that. My position is PG should allow for it, but Jace wants full transparency and it is what it is, and I've come to accept that that's what the current climate of the gaming community wants, so it's for the best, but the reality is, is that there's certain old-school gamers that are never going to see this wars as a direct result. Is it possible that the idea that you can have private referee verification is a bit too idealistic, given that we've seen people abuse it, or do you think it is well, plausible? To be honest with you, it's a trust issue. Um, Walter did it for years, back in 1981. Think about it, he was the only referee. Any score verified in 1981 was verified by Walter. It's not on tape. Only Walter saw it, and yet people are accepting these world record bad news. So if it works for Walter, why couldn't it work for anyone else? The, my response to me would be, perhaps it didn't exactly work for Walter. Obviously, he favors certain people and gives them credibility of scores. Well, True, but think of all the other scores out there for people that have nothing to do with Billy Mitchell and Chris Ira and friends of Walter. There's a lot of scores that Walter saw back in the day that he had no interest whatsoever in the person and yet he validated their scores. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag of tricks. Uh, you can always signal out the scores attributed to Billy and Chris Ira and people like that. You could have a question mark or an asterisk attached to it and say, well, did they really do it? Um, but the other scores out there, which is the vast majority of the scores in the TG database, which back in the day were likely only verified by Walter, people seem to be accepting them. I guess it's a stigmata of having scores verified by Walter that are related to Billy and others. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Now that Billy's scores are summarily removed from the database, the whole point is moved. Um, do you still attend uh, big gaming events? No, I, I can't because of my job. The only gaming event I'm even aware of is the one that used to take place every May at Fun Spot. I haven't gone to that since 2014, and mm. nowadays I typically only try to get up there every November, but I had to skip there recently again because of my job, just like I'm probably going to skip this year. So my days of attending events are basically a thing of the past. All right. Um, basically, well, the question I want to ask, I'll get to it, is the, the Midwest Gaming Classic uh, happened right after the Billy Mitchell verdict, and Billy Mitchell and Richie Knuckles were announcing that they were going to make a statement, and then I, uh, my impression is that the event... I wouldn't trust anything coming from Richie Knuckles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but organize, uh, my impression is that the organizers of the event told them, no, we're not letting you do some big public thing here, and they ended up doing it. And that's why Billy Mitchell released this video kind of in the hallway, you know, where he's just kind of talking quietly in the hallway, saying everything will be transparent. Did you also happen to know that the venue that Billy chose, he's a board of directors at that venue? It's mm. a controlled environment. Really? Billy is? I was told that that place that he had this thing filmed at, he's on the board of directors at that place. Mm. I mean, the whole thing just smells. Interesting. Right? I did not know that. I don't I don't trust anything that comes out of Billy or Richie Knuckles. I just don't. I mean, Billy could duplicate and say, here, I just did a million and fifty on Donkey Kong that proves what I did before. No, it proves that you did a million and fifty now. That's all it does. Gosh, it's very interesting now. So, gosh, could it could it be that, like... I think like, it would be Bobby Blackwolf that told me I used to work directors of that number of that organization. So could it be that, like, they wanted to make it look like, oh, we have all this evidence that we could totally present of our innocence, but they really wanted to buy some time for the presentation no, at I, SMGE? No, yeah. I mean, personally, I think this whole road to redemption thing is just Billy's last gas effort at trying to... Uh, get back into the limelight, because right now, it just seems like he's in free fall. And Billy's the type of person, the personality that's got to be in the limelight, just like Walter is. They've got a symbiotic relationship. Walter needs Billy, and Billy needs Walter. Mm -hmm. Billy needs Walter to be in print. 
Walter needs Billy to be in the media. So one always supports the other. That's why Walter commandeered the mic during that interview with uh, Billy on that panel with Black Wolf there. Yeah. After Walter commandeered the mic, they really spoke out. They pretty much ignored the guy, uh, Bobby Black Wolf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he talked about that with uh, Tipster once. Yeah, I had a good uh, conversation with Tipster, Robert Santel. I really got a kick out of that. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely, I really appreciated your, your interview with him over there. That was great. Oh, no problem. Um, I guess, well, the question I was leading up as far as events is that there are definitely people kind of who are event goers who see and understand the evidence, who know that Billy Mitchell is a liar and a cheater, and that he's mistreated people over this. And then obviously there's people on the other end who are very much in his camp. Uh, since you're not going to events, maybe you're not really in a position to speak on it, but like, how do you, do you have any thoughts on how that might play out with these very disparate camps sort of intermingling. Well, to be honest with you, um, there's some people, and I have to say that back in 2007, early 2007, late 2006, I was pro Billy. I had no reason not to be. Um, and chances are there's a lot of people that, like in Gold and Triforce, they were with their dying breath, they're going to defend Billy and everything he did, and Billy could do no wrong. Proof to me otherwise, even though the proof is pretty much written on the wall. Mm-hmm. But uh, the reality is, they will be unwavering in their support of it. Doesn't matter. You can have it in writing on videotape that he cheated. They're still not going to believe it. And they're entitled to their position. And no matter what you come out with, evidence wise, they will not believe it. You can have a computer program to play dragster and go through a billion iterations, and Triforce is still not going to believe it. Because that's just the way they are. Mm-hmm. And is it because they cannot be in the media seen as opposing Billy? It's possible. It's quite possible that it's like God forbid you turn on the fraternity brother or something. It's some mm, people yeah. that is so deeply um, attached to that person from a friendship base or a professional basis, they will not go against him. But then. Uh... Over here, talk talking ill of Billy. Billy talking ill of I. Oh yeah, no. Well, Mike was talking ill of either of them. They never will. Well, especially because Todd, you know, he was the the referee for one of his scores, and so Billy can't say anything negative about Todd. Todd can't say anything negative about Billy. Not that they would, but quid pro quo. Exactly. And then that gets into a question. There's going to be a lot of people at these events who are just like, ah, oh, these cheaters, and, uh, you know, they're, they're getting this celebrated. This is why, and you don't know this, and I can, again, if you send me the email, I will send you proof of this. Mm. Joel Reff, who's a deceased gamer now, yes. who's a reserve uh, former champion, Joel Reff, who's a paralegal acting as counsel for Walter and Billy, sent me a message. I think you uh, got wind of the fact that Walter um, cheated me out of stock transactions from TG from a long time ago. Yeah. Walter wanted to make amends. So Walt, so Joel sends an email saying that Walter is feeling that he wants to clear the air and he is willing to send a cash payment to mm. you in an amount to be determined and there may be additional amounts to come. <laughs> but for you to get this, you have to sign this agreement that for 10 years you will not speak ill of Twin Galaxies, Billy Mitchell, or Walter Day. I shared this with Jace, Jace Hall. I, I've seen Jace, the document. I am the only person out of 17 or 18 people that this was sent to that did not sign it. Because had I signed this, I can't even have this conversation with you right now. Mm-hmm. I couldn't have done the texture interview or anything else. They wanted to block anyone that could speak ill you know, against all that crap that was going on all these years ago, for 10 years. They want to cover it up. Mm-hmm. And that was part of the uh, transition to Jace Hall ownership? Or? Well, Jace was already in charge of TG, but this was separate. This had nothing to do with Jace. Oh, all right. It came on its own in December of 2013 or 2014. Oh. I still got the email. I can and stuff. I still have the documents that Joel even wanted me to <laughs> and my responses to Joel. 
I mean, it's really funny. It's like hush money payments. Yeah. The funny thing is, it would be sign this. We'll give you an amount of money, but we won't tell you what it is. Mm-hmm. You may get an amount of money down the line, or you may not. <laughs> Basically, they can give me a dollar. And for 10 years, I had to keep my mouth shut because I signed something. Mm-hmm. I, t- I told Chase, do you honestly God think anyone in their right mind would sign this? And apparently 16 or 17 other people did. I'm the only one out of the 17 or 18 people that did not sign it. Let, let, me, let me tell you, I, I have seen it. I can't say uh, who, who passed it off to me, but uh, I read well, it. She's aware of it. Was that, yeah, I, I, and I read it, and without even them telling me about it, I read it, I'm like, who the heck would sign this? Yeah, but Chase told me Everyone else that this was sent to signed it except for me. This is not public knowledge. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> well, that's what it really is. It, it really is. And I don't, I don't know if it's been, the document has actually been published openly, but it, it, it is laughable. Yeah. I mean, this is not the first time that Walters tried to engage in hush money attempts. I got documentation from... From the way, way back with, uh, I think it's 1984 to 87, where Steve Harris had to complain about Walter and Billy, and I could even email you this, it was from Sterling Publishing, where they were trying to extort $3,000 from Steve Harris for basically just merely showing up at one of his events. And Steve Harris is saying, why would I have to pay this? <laughs> I, just, I got the documents from it. Yeah, that was a thing, like... um. Are you talking about the thing in the 80s where Steve Harris wanted to submit to Guinness, but then Twin Galaxies had the... Something like that. I got, these, I got the documents for that. Oh, gosh. I know where I got them. I know who I got them from, but I got the documents for it. Mm-hmm. Walter and Billy Mitchell engaging in hush money. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, in extortion. <laughs> this is the Walter and Billy that most people don't know. That's incredible. <laughs> we would happily open the floor to anything you wish to discuss about any of this. I, I can tell you that after um, all these years now, now when you think about it, it's been 17, 18 years since the week came on premise. Um, it's been, oh geez, 15 years since King of Kong started filming. It's been 13, 12, 13 years since the theaters. I mean, time flies. So some of the facts are starting to get a little fuzzy, but thankfully I got most of it documented in certain files I've already published or they've saved on my hard drives here because it's nice for people to understand what really happened back then. Because uh, a lot of people, they watch King of Kong and they make judgments of what happened and about people participating in it based on a 90-minute film. I mean, it's amazing how people have formulated opinions of, for instance, myself. I'm in the film for not even three minutes and yet by the end of those three minutes, they take a look at me and say, oh, that's a jerk. Mm-hmm. Three minutes. I remember being in the movie theater in Manhattan uh, shortly after it was released. And I'm in there with the Frog and Champion, and Pat Buffet, and we're watching it. And there's a scene in the movie near the end where they show a chronicle of what's happened next. Yeah. It shows Robert Munchak, you know, resigned from TG, and the audience is like snickering at that. Because it makes it sound like I resigned out of disgrace or something like that. In reality, if I left TG on my own accord because of Walter, mm-hmm. I had nothing to do with anybody. And um, then I'm going down the elevator with people that would say, and they finally realize who I am in the elevator. And there's people like, it's dead silent. They don't know what to say. And someone finally goes, What do you think of the movie? I said, It's okay. <laughs> I, I realized that they recognized me in the elevator. They didn't know I was in the theater, but they sure as hell saw me in the elevator. Mm. <laughs> the point being is that they made a, an assessment based on seeing me in the film for almost three minutes or less. And I wish people knew the truth behind this film. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, they see more of Billy and Steve in it. Billy's pointed out, you know, made out to be some villain. Billy's a dick. I mean, I might say that flat out, but most people that know him will tell you, you know, that's Billy, all right. It's the Billy behind the scenes that you generally don't see. That's the nice part of him. And Billy can be a nice person behind the scenes. He just chooses to show in the media, you know, the arrogant Billy. That's, that's his decision to do so. Mm-hmm. I, I spoke with somebody else who used to be nice. Hmm. 
I spoke with somebody else who used to be a TG ref, and he said that basically Billy's just a completely different person in front of the camera. You can sit and have a regular conversation yeah. with him. Camera turns on, he becomes the persona. Yeah, there's, there's Billy the gamer, and there's Billy the person. Billy the gamer is unfortunately what most people end up seeing. Also, uh, regarding King of Kong, last night I was uh, doing a little prep for this interview, and I just kind of you know, thought, whatever, I'll just throw the movie on and have that going while I'm doing this uh, prep work. And I know something I've never noticed before, actually. So the narrative is that uh, uh, we be none of the scores were accepted and stuff. Uh, towards the end of that event in Florida, you said it was Pompano? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, they had all these cabinets out and they were reserved for people that had their name above them, Abner Ash, Mendora Self, so, like that was reserved for them and it had their high score. And there's two placards above the Donkey Kong machine and there's Billy Mitchell and it says it scored 1.047. And then behind that, kind of, you know, behind and off the side of Steve Weeby, and you can see the 1.0 of his 1 million score. That is apparently... (laughs) But I never noticed that in the movie before. Well, you know, if you have the um, DVD and you listen to the the, uh, director's comments, Mm. while they're showing the scene of Walter entering the score into the database of Billy Mitchell's 1.47 million... You can listen to Seth and Ed, I forget which room says this. They mentioned that Margaret personally removed the score from the database two days later. But they mm. left it out of the physical movie. You would have to buy the DVD and listen to the director's comments to know that. Yeah. So it's nice that they acknowledge that I did that. But a little bit better if in the movie they show it to show that, yes, I am impartial. Mm-hmm. But they did. They wanted to craft a storyline that painted TG, including myself, as biased towards Billy. To say nothing of the fact that uh, Tim Zerby's name never comes up. Yep. And there's a reason for that. Tim Zerby effectively is like plain vanilla, whereas Billy versus <clears throat> Steve is black and white. Yeah. That, that brings up another question. I saw an interview where uh, I don't put much stock in this claim, but uh, it was either Seth or Ed um, said that they chose not to include Tim Serby because there was some point of contention or some controversy around his score that some people didn't yes. recognize it. Oh, yes. Ah, yeah. <laughs> That's what kind of what I figured. There are people, when included, that believe that the King of Kong story originated way before King of Kong Know, as a term was even created. Um, there were anecdotes that suggest that they were already aware of this Billy Mitchell, Steve Weeby thing. And that occurred even before they showed up at Fun Spot to do the initial filming. And we'll never know for sure. Yeah. Never will. What annoys me, though, is in a lot of interviews, Seth and Ed are presented with people asking questions about, well, there are a lot of people saying that there's certain elements of this movie that are not true or they're misstated, and they're saying, well, you know, we don't have time to look at this stuff, and they're so dismissive about it because they don't want to admit. They knew damn well that they were presenting evidence that was distorted, misstated, half-truths. They just wanted to get that side of the story out there. Mm-hmm. Not the whole story, but just enough to convey the viewpoint that, you know, bad TG was Steve Wheat. Mm-hmm. You know what? The average person that sees it, that's exactly what they're going to come out of that movie thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And and to be frank, and I said this in the post I wrote a couple of days ago, that I used to, because I saw the movie, thought, oh, you know, Billy's a jerk and not blah, blah, blah. And then I read more about the movie, about what you and Walter had written. And I, after that, I would defend Billy and Twin Galaxies to people and say, no, the movie didn't make it, you know. It wasn't really representative of the truth. Of course, now I know that... The answer to the saddest part of all is Brian Coop. Brian Coop Mm. has skewered. Mm. There was a YouTube clip. It was uh, the guy running around to Jersey somewhere telling people in the damnedest places there's a Donkey Kong kill screen coming up. I mean, they made a laughing stock out of Brian Coop. Mm. We were telling Brian after the movie came out, we were serious about this. We told him, Brian... You should copyright this Donkey Kong kill screen coming. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, why not? Catch it on it. Yeah. You never did it. 
Yeah. There's actually T-shirts made. That's a Brian Cruz image on it, showing you the Duncan Cartel street coming up. <laughs> Ridiculous. My boss at my... You might like this on a, out there. If you look it up on Google... Oh, really? It's kind of saying something about the Tron life cycle patterns. If you don't know the pattern, you will die. So there's, there's an image of myself on there. It's a comic <laughs> representation of me saying that. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. But if you do know, Google search, Robert Richard T-shirt, uh, come on. I will totally look that up. Yeah, and 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 those sorts of lines they get they, they just stick in people's memories. My my boss at my last job, he loved the movie we would talk about sometimes, and he he had no idea who anyone's name in the movie. Even Billy Mitchell, he would say that guy with the hair, but he would always be like Donkey Kong Kill Screen coming up. <laughs> we told Brian he should rent out his services. <laughs> show up at frat parties and graduations <laughs> and ceremonies and weddings to show up. Oh my gosh. 150 bucks just interrupt the wedding in progress saying it's a donkey Kong kill screen company. Fine, <laughs> <laughs> you make a killing. You make a thousand dollars a day bonus. <laughs> Somebody would totally, absolutely hire him to do that. I mean, I, I think the idea would have been hilarious back then. <laughs> Probably arrested doing it, but <laughs> how is uh, what's Brian Koo up to these days? If you don't mind me asking, I'm not trying to get too personal into yeah, his business. Nobody knows. Uh, he, he doesn't show up like clockwork with one spot. His own friends don't see him for weeks or months on end. Mm. When he does show up, he wears a hoodie and he goes through fun spots checking the coin spots for the turn tokens, and then off he goes. He doesn't even play a game. Mm. I mean, it's like he's a resident of New Hampshire, but no one knows who, you know, where he is and what he does. Mm, interesting. He doesn't play games anymore. He retired to take fun spot to New Hampshire to play games. But then, amusingly, he decided he's going to get a job for eight hours a day to get extra tokens to play games. Now, my fun spot tokens are 16 cents a pop, so you really don't need to. Mm. So he ended up working for eight hours a day. And he's too tired to play video games after that. So basically, he's not retired. Yeah. But what he's doing, nobody knows. Hmm. I last heard he was selling tires out of the back seat of his car to people that need spare tires. I mean, nobody really knows <laughs> what he does. Uh, he was in a video I found going to a Tumwa with uh, Billy and Triforce, I think. He still travels to gaming events. I don't know why, but he does. Uh, he's just so deeply uh, enamored with you know the idea of being around Walter and Billy. Yeah, I guess my follow them around like that, but Brian apparently does. I guess my point of curiosity as far as he goes is how much he's in the uh, the, the circle of people who are in on in on the in on the even know. Um, I know that there's a limited number of people that actually got paid being in Game of Thrones. Steve Weeb and Billy being two of them. Steve Sanders and Walter might have been a third or fourth, but no one else to my knowledge did. But Brian's always pretty much you know, followed Billy around like a lost puppy for years now. Hmm. Um, yeah, we've exhausted my questions, but again, anything you want, you feel you want to talk about, get on the record here. No, I think that's it. It was, uh, you know, thanks again for the opportunity for, for the interview and for uh, having a chance to contribute more to your inquiries of the King of Kong and clear up a couple of things. Because I, I know that the, uh, you know, it is what it is, bottom line is. And like I said earlier, back in the day, you know, as referees, we made decisions based on our then experience, and some of the decisions are not necessarily good ones. And unfortunately, in this particular case, it was a really bad one, and it just stuck out because of the eminence of the title. It's uh, unfortunate, but back then, there was no um, open viewing of records for the entire gaming community to see it. So we had to do a thing the best that we could. And if we made a bad call, I hate to say it, it was a, it was a bad call that was set in stone. And it could be reversed under the current teaching policy many years later. Mm, and, and thank you so much. I mean, the honor has been all mine. 
I so appreciate you coming on here and talking about all this stuff. Uh, why you, uh, you know, you got to finish it, but I, I was, uh, once I saw what you did, and I saw you put a lot of effort into it, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance. If you had any other questions that I could answer, I'd be happy to help out. Gosh, thank you. I do, I uh, would very much like to uh, keep in touch about anything, and I'll uh, get you my email address for uh, any other. Yeah, send me the email, and I'll send you all those things I promised. Yeah, especially that um, uh, factual errors. From picture yeah, it's an Excel format. As long as you have access to Excel, you can access it. Uh, I have Open Office, but uh, I have an older computer that has Excel if I have to. So I'll... I might have saved it as an HTML, I'll see. But it's an Excel format. But if you need to, I can try to translate. I can try to save it as a PDF file. But some of these things have large um, spreadsheets to them. So cool. I'll send you what I have in any event. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about, uh, yeah, just send me what I have, and if I'm not able to make it work, then we'll uh, we'll figure it out from there. Yeah, because Excel can be saved as PDF for stuff and stuff. Cool. Thank you again so much for your time. This has been incredible. Uh, no problem. You take care. You too. Have a fantastic one.